Welcome back to the Bourbon and BS podcast. This is episode 114, Back to the Basics. We have very special guests tonight, and I'm very, very excited. This is going to be an interesting podcast episode here. And uh, without further ado, before I even go into the sponsors, I want to get these guys on the screen. And then I have other guests joining us for the second part of part one, as well as part two of episode 114. So we have with us tonight on the stage the remote stage because we're still all doing this remotely. That's right. Uh, I've got Alan Rubin from Alec Bradley Cigars. He's the owner of Alec Bradley Cigars. He's in the bottom part of your screen if you guys are watching the video here. Welcome, Alan. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's our pleasure. And then I've also got a uh, repeat guest. Are we on episode, what, four? Do you know? Yeah, I think it was like four, four episodes ago, maybe. It wasn't that long ago at all. But you've been on, I think, about four times. I think this is my third. Third time. All right. It just seems yep. like so much. <laughs> it seems like a lot. I have yeah. a lasting impression. Right. We should Ryan, work, we should work with Ryan Bonnest, everyone, uh, from, also from Alec Bradley Cigars. So happy to have you guys on. Welcome. Uh, before we get in the conversation, we're doing some, some things differently tonight, which uh, I'm looking forward to. But I want to thank our sponsors. So Tinderbox at Easton, uh, we have a great special from them this week. And I'm going to show that on the screen here for you guys. But uh, it's going to be 25% off. It's the uh, Alec Bradley stay at home sampler this week. So it is a six pack sampler and normally retails for $60 and it's going to be $45 for this week or while supplies last or call it limited time. But basically we're, we're going to have these out there trying to make everyone stay at home and uh, enjoy their time. So we can ship it out to you. If you guys are interested, go ahead and email Easton Tinderbox at gmail.com. And we want to thank them for sponsoring and offering that great deal. You have the uh, Alec Bradley medalist. You have the Prinsado Lost Art, the Gatekeeper, the Magic Toast, the Black Market Esteli, and then the one we are featuring tonight, which is the Alec Bradley Tempest Nicaragua, which I uh, out of the, that pack, it's, it's hard to pick, but that's probably my favorite one. So I'm happy we're doing that one tonight. And so if you guys are interested, go ahead and get a hold of Tinderbox at Easton. Also, we want to thank Altidus USA for the continued support. They're doing a year sponsor, and we – we love having the support. Normally, they have the second featured cigar, and Josh Bentley has done a lot of work on that, as well as Paul Waller. We thank them. Uh, tonight, it's uh, all Alec Bradley products, and they do not mind when we have great guests like you guys on that we're going to feature other cigars. So but thank you all to this for the continued support, and also the BS Cigar Company for the continued support as well. The gold and silver are currently in stock at Easton Tinderbox. And that is the only place you can find them. And they have been going very, very quickly in this uh, downtime. Everyone seems to be smoking and drinking a lot more right now. <laughs> so we've been shipping a lot all over. So, uh, guys, thank you very much for the sponsors and everything. And you guys, thank you for uh, being a part of this and, and featuring your cigars and helping us out with that sampler for the Tinderbox at Easton. It kind of the synergy there is, is really, really nice. Um, I appreciate that. I'm sure everyone else is because we've already sold several of them since uh, Ryan and I were doing that uh, last night. So that's good. What were we doing feedback. last night? Was it last night? Yeah, it was last night. The yeah, uh, yeah. sampler. Yeah. The sampler. You were there. <laughs> the sampler. Yeah. Yeah, you were there. Yeah, that's right. I remember that now. I remember Tonight, that. Tonight, we are going to be, like I, I mentioned, we're going to be smoking the Tempest Nicaragua. We are going to be drinking something a little different. So we are the Bourbon and BS podcast. And as Alan said, he's like, well, I, I saw the Bourbon and BS podcast, and then we decided to drink. Glenfiddich 15. We all are drinking Glenfiddich 15. We got some <laughs> tables on there. Uh, apparently, they just revamped it. So I think they've been sitting on their bottles a little, a little longer than I have. But I, uh, I went out and grabbed new packaging. And I'm going to dive right into this. And, and we'll get into the cigars here in a little bit because we have some other guys that are, are going to be talking about it with us. But I, the Glenfiddich 15 used to be one of my go-to drinks. But this is over 10 years ago. So, and then I started getting into Irish whiskeys and I got into bourbons. Obviously, the craze now is, is bourbon, bourbon, bourbon. And um, so I jumped at the opportunity when you guys have a relationship with Glenfiddich and explain that a little bit for me. Yeah. So uh, many years ago, we had done an event, a whiskey event out in Las Vegas called, and it was at the original time, it was called the Ultimate Whiskey Experience. Uh, and it changed to Nth. And um, we were there as really the only cigar company. And we were doing a masterclass on cigars and whiskey. And 
the next morning there was a uh, there was a golf tournament, and every major distiller in the world was there. And so, needless to say, by the second hole, you, you can't remember your own name, right? They're all bringing their own bottles. By the second hole. Oh, uh, let me because they're pouring. They're they're pouring all cask strength from whatever their distilleries are. Yeah, right, right. And everyone is just. And we happened to meet the master distiller at the time for William Grant, a guy named uh, Ian Miller, and then we hit off. You know, we hit it off on a relationship, and we kept it going. And we said, "Hey, there's a great synergy between whiskey and cigars, and and you know, scotch and cigars specifically at the time." Absolutely. And it, it just it just manifested itself, and we have we are really the only cigar that William Grant does any real pairings with. They may do some stuff on the side here and there, but uh, we actually do a pairing for every one of their expressions. So from Glenn Fittick 12, which is the basis of their line that they built their company on, they're a sixth generation company. Needless to say, they've been around for, for a long, long time. Yeah, a while, a while. Yeah, so 12, 14, 15, 18, uh, Age of Discovery 19, you know, every expression, they actually send us bottles. Really? And, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, good. Part that's a good relationship. Of, my friend, that's part of the deal. And uh, <laughs> and good. and we send them cigars as well. And we all do these pairings. And then we get, yeah. you know, we get on and talk. But we've also done it with uh, Belvini, which is part of their portfolio. Uh, Hudson, which is out of the Tuttletown Distillery in New York. Yeah. Uh, Hudson, you know, Hudson Four Grain. And you guys did, I think, a maple cask. And the maple so, cask episodes, yeah. yeah any, anytime we do an event together, um, where there's where there's some type of, of whiskey and cigars, we actually do all the pairings in advance, and then that's how we that's how we present. So that's it's been a, it's been a spectacular relationship for I think for everybody. I hope it, it sounds like it's a win win to me based on that. It is. You just you just uh, described a lot of people's like kind of dream jobs there as far as that goes. But the other thing is is before they're going to launch something new, yeah. we get it. Now, do you return that favor as well? Yeah, I mean they they are never out of cigars. To be honest with you, I mean it's from the from one of the owners, all of their you know ambassadors worldwide. I've done trainings for for everybody in the U.S. and Canada, uh, so that if they're going to do an event, and see, I think what people understand, specifically what they understand, is that if somebody is on is in an on premise place where there's cigars and whiskey, and they light up a cigar, yeah, generally it's not going to be a singular whiskey, right? They're going to do a second and third pour. Absolutely, they're not. They're going to keep drinking while they're smoking, which means yeah. they're in. They're in the seat for an hour plus. So, uh, the relationship has just been great. They're you know they're family owned. We're family owned. Right. Uh, we're now multi generational. Not as far as they are, but um, and it's very much about the product. They don't have shareholders. They have family members. And no, uh, right. yeah, so there's just been a, a tremendous amount of great synergy. And they're just, a, a, honestly, they're a phenomenal family and company to work with. And they've been a great partner from the time we started. That's great. I mean, that's, that's uh, and that's what it's all about, right? A lot of times when it comes into to business with that is, is, is making those relationships because when, when there is a, a it, it makes sense to do something where it's a team up type of event. That's something that, especially in, at least in the cigar industry and, and also in the, the whiskey world and the spirits world, not everyone has those relationships with something that is a a good balance with with their product. It's usually up to the, you know, the distributors or it's up to like the the, the reps in certain areas to try to pair these things up. But to, to do it at the level you guys have done it, it it's kind of it takes the guessing work out of it because from 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 the higher level, from the family level or the corporate level, whatever you want to call it. You guys have already done a lot of this stuff and you, you kind of can collaborate uh, on pairings as opposed to where Ryan and then other reps or other companies would have to, you know, he's he's meeting someone from this one and then he's in one region and he's pairing the, you know, the Tempest Nicaragua with some bourbon where someone on the other, you know, part of the country is doing the Tempest Nicaragua with something else. And and there's a consistency there, which I, I like. Yeah, I mean, if if Ryan or one of our other territory managers is doing an event at a cigar bar, we ask him, okay, what you know, what expressions do do they carry behind the bar? Maybe they'll carry another one or two expressions if we're going to do an event. And then we tell them, hey, if you're going to do a Glenfiddich 15, this is the cigar that would pair with it. If you're going right. to do the IPA or a Project 20 or you know the the 14, uh, this is what we have all agreed upon between both companies as yeah. to what would pair well. So, and it's, it's a process. I mean, 
I can tell you the first time they sent me two bottles, mm -hmm. uh, one, I don't remember getting to my bed and I never lit a cigar. Uh, and I realized, wow. I realized like you, this is not how you do a pairing. So the next night, you know, I went back and did it again. And I literally nosed the whiskey for like 45 minutes yeah. to understand what are the, what are the aromatics I'm getting off of it? And then, so the first time I was just so excited that they sent me bottles of whiskey. Well, in all fairness, the, both ways are ways to do it. It's just a matter of, of what you're trying to get out of it. Because first night, it sounds like you got a lot of a lot of whiskey out of it. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> a lot. A or lot. you were at least told the next morning. I actually forgot why I was there drinking. Um, it was a, it was supposed to be to do a pairing. But again, what happens is that was many years ago. You know, you yeah. learn time you know, what the notes are, what you're looking for. And we actually have a process. Like we go through a process um, and my sons, Alec and Bradley are both into whiskey as well. So they very much embrace the process of what we do. It, it's, it's a, it's really a, it becomes a little more scientific than people would think. No, absolutely. And I mean, and it does, I mean, it, it sounds fun when you say like, it takes a lot of experience and trial and error. So you have to drink a lot of things. You have to smoke a lot of things. I mean, it sounds terrible to a lot of people, but uh, there is a lot too. I mean, you basically described going from like uh, you were like drinking whiskey, like like freshman in college drink, you know, natural light or natty light. I mean, you're just like drinking to drink that first night. And then you started being like, well, wait a second. Let me that didn't go well. I didn't really get much out of that. Right. So maybe a hangover. And then you went right. to the point of, now you want to get more out of it and you're drinking for a different purpose, which is I agree. I mean, that's there is always a balance there, obviously, that you can you can you can sample it but there are plenty of the nights even when you're trying to sample that uh you know after you're like all right well, yeah we, we paired it now let's have another drink you know it, there's there's a there's a good balance there yeah i i think the other part is that you know a company like william grant which is they're they're basically the largest they started the the original william grant started single malt scotch whiskey and brought it to market and there's so there ends up being a lot of responsibility there to make sure that yeah. we get the bearings right um and so that's why we started going through this this pretty exhausting process of how to do it. Now, what happens once I start to understand the whiskey, now I have to understand what cigar can we put with it to make it work well based on the style of which we want to pair. So it's it, there's a lot there. There's times it takes me a week of going out and trying to figure out what what works with what. Yeah. Uh, so with this one, what what do you what do you know about? I mean, since you guys are, are obviously in Allen, you've you spent a lot of time with the different uh, offerings from Glenfiddich. I mean, the one that I'll say this, when I when I found this this bottle on the shelf, again, I hadn't looked at scotches for a while. I, I've kind of gone off of that. But I remember there was a time in the state of Ohio where you had Glenfiddich 12-year, and it was $40. And then you had Glenfiddich 15-year, and it was $45. And I was like, wow, that's that's pretty close. That makes that makes sense. That's that's good. And then the 18 was like $70. And I was like, man, that 18 must be really good. Cause this is when I was first getting into the scotches, right? First getting into whiskeys in general. We're going back, like I said, like probably 15 years ago. And and what I found interesting, and it's it's I think a good point for a lot of people uh, that are newer into bourbons. And also, even if you're a bourbon drinker, you're not really into scotch. I hear a lot of bourbon drinkers like, I don't really like scotches, I don't like Irish whiskey. Well, what have you had? Well, I had McAllen 12 and I didn't like it or I had Lafroy and I didn't like it. And I was like, well, those are two different things. And when you get down to this, the 12 year, I thought was OK. I thought, you know, Glenfiddich 12 year, it's it's a good whiskey. I tried the 15 and I, I absolutely early on fell in love with the bottle. There's yeah. like a little bit of the 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 oakiness to it, but then there's actually like a sweetness part of it. And yeah. I didn't know why. And so I started looking into it and I really like that. And so I finally splurged for the 18 year one time. And I was like, well, I like the 15 better, like as far as a daily you know, drink your nightcap type of a thing. Cause that's what I was using it for back, back in the day. It was like kind of a, you know, it's, I was, I was in my, my, you know, probably mid to late twenties and I'm like, all right, I got the office job. It's like, all right, now you start smoking cigars. This is what 20 some year old males do. Right. <laughs> like, all right, I got, I got, I got the, you know, I got, I got to have a, a good shoes. I got to have good clothes. All right. Now what's next. All right. Cigars. Now I got to do scotches. Cause that's what, that's what guys do. And so I learned very early on that the, the year, is is not something i know this sounds very elementary to a lot of people but the year does not have to do with just the same juice sitting there for for three more years oh no and this 15 was a unique story with that solera cast type thing yeah so that's 
I think that's the key. First off, uh, Glenfiddich 15 is probably my favorite out of everything that they produce. And I've, I've pretty much had everything that they produce other than some of their limited bottlings that go to collectors. Yeah. Um, and I think 15 is the most balanced. Uh, it, it's a very easy drinking whiskey. And yeah, the Solera vat that they do, they don't really use the term batted anymore, but the Solera, you know, vat that yeah. they do is what's so cool is that it never goes under half full. So as they refill it to, you know, some of the whiskey ultimately in this giant vat has, can be 60, 70, 80 years old. You know, mm -hmm. it's just, they keep adding to it to keep it balanced, but uh, it's amazing. And um yeah, I think I think if, if you're a scotch drinker, even if you're not a scotch drinker and you're a whiskey drinker, the Glen Fiddick 15 may still have a lot of appeal to you. Yeah, I agree. I think it's kind of a bridge type between different different areas of whiskeys because it's interesting. So like Brian Joyce, the, the owner of Tinderbox, one of our sponsors, you know, he he he's a big smoky peaty guy. He likes the Lafroy, he likes Lagavulin, and he likes that. So I told him that I, I had this and and we were we were and he's just kind of like, yeah, I've had it. I, I'm not a huge fan. And I and I get it because it is quite different than some of the more smokier, peatier scotch, because there's such a variety when it comes to that. And I think when we talk bourbon every week, it's it's much the same. It's, there's such a variety of bourbon anymore, especially now. Is yeah. that so I mean it's just it's a huge scope. So I think this one is going to hit a little bit of the scotch notes as far as what people think of scotch notes, but it's also going to have the, the, the sweetness that I think can carry people over from say, obviously bourbons or Irish or even like Canadian whiskey. I think this is one that is a, a pretty universally people have tried it around me before in the past and they, they seem to really enjoy it. They're like, you know, that's not what I was expecting. Yeah. And, and actually I think you guys said you did a, a Glen Pittick 14, mm -hmm. which was really produced for the American market, uh, the people who drink American whiskey. Yeah. Uh, they they use new oak barrels, you know, which is mm -hmm. what right, which is what bourbon and yeah. is is aged in, and it's got a little bit less of that maybe musty nose you get off of aged Scotch, but it's got a little higher level of sweetness. So again, yeah. there's another expression from Glenfiddich that would maybe hit that type of uh, that consumer. Ryan, what do you think of this? You've been kind of quiet up there. What do you think of this? Uh, you're you're no sipping on some Glen Fitting with us. I don't know if you know that. What's you're, that? Your gorgeous voice. And I'm uh, not going to suck on, up to Alan on air, so I, I'm not going to say anything. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm, oh, we just lost Ryan. Oh, oh, that's, yeah. that's oh man. Uh, you know, scotch was something that, that – you know, I always grew up knowing that scotch was was one of those spirits that they always refer to as an acquired taste. Right. Um, and it was through working with this company and our relationship with William Grant that did give me that exposure towards scotch. And, you know, I, I very I've been very cautious to look at things as unbiased as possible. And a lot of the expressions that William Grant puts out are, are things that I really enjoy. And not just that, I mean, them as a company and the stuff that they've done uh, yeah. with, with their different types of scotches, specifically referring to like their experimental series where they started coming out with the IPA stuff. They started coming out with, you know, the fire and cane where, where you know, you're using uh, casts for dark rum. You know, it, it was a company that I think that that for as much as they keep it classic, you know, they really do a really good job of trying to keep something more modern, something different going on. I, I thought, you know, that was one of the reasons why our company fits really well with uh, them, because I, I think we do that a lot with like our types of products. You know, you look at something like a Connecticut or a Prinzado, and then you look at something like a Blind Faith or a Magic Toast, and they almost don't even look like they're made by the same company. But it, it's that sort of general appeal, that that variety that I think keeps people interested. You know, I don't think there's somebody that could drink, you know, and I think you kind of hit on this saying like, Oh, I, I tried, you know, Glenfiddich 12. I don't like Glenfiddich. That, that's just a silly saying. There's so many different types of uh, nuances and, and, and different approaches that I think there's something in there for everybody. I really do. Well, I think that's what, I mean, you're seeing that in, in, in the bourbon world. I, I mean, you see it more, I think in the two industries that we're talking about, especially in the first part here is that, you, you try to, you know, dip your toe into different 
markets that that are proven to be out there. But when you have a, a staple name like Glenfiddich, it's tough to come out with. So if you're a, a Glenfiddich 12 or 18 or even 15, and you come out with a Glenfiddich 14, you may not be going after the Glenfiddich fans because they might try something like that. And they're like, ah, no, this is not what I, I like. This is this is way too different from what I know of Glenn Fiddick. Alec Bradley would be the same thing, right? You know, you're used to smoking, like you had mentioned some of them. You know, you, you smoke, uh, you know, the newer Magic Toast, and you're used to smoking, say, um, like the Connecticut's, or you're, you're used to smoking, um, like even the Tempest Nicaragua, like we're smoking now. And it's like, you have the full-bodied stuff, and not everyone's going to like the whole portfolio. And I, But I right. think, it, it's to your point, there's something for everyone when you have a wider portfolio, as opposed to just pigeonholing yourself into, we just do you know, the, the PD or the smokier scotches, or we just do the mild to medium cigars very well. And when you come out with a full body cigar, it, it's, it's lost on your, your, your following. It's, it's lost on your fans because they smoke it and they, they might smoke it the first time, but they smoke it like, well, all right, this is totally different. I'm going back to what I know and what I like, but I, you, you do, you get to be introduced, I guess, on both sides of it. Um, this one, I, I, I do think is very cool just because it does have the sherry cast, which is a little bit newer in, in popularity as far as for the bourbon world, which we talk about most most often here. Um, so this is something that, that does uh, bring in not only the virgin oak barrels, but also the European sherry cast. So I think that's something that if you guys don't know much about the Glenfiddich world or the Scotch world, there's stuff going on in, in different parts of the world, different whiskeys from different parts of the world that you might actually, you know, something like this, if you like something like an angel's envy or something like that, I think this might be something that if you're looking to try something else, this might be something that you branch off to a little bit in the Scotch world. See what you think of it. What do you think of this whiskey, Ryan? As you take a sip and your mouth's full. You know, I've been sitting here. I've been watching very diligently to be like, all right, I know they were drinking before. Are they drinking now? Can 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 I touch this yet? And then, uh, yes, now I'm, in, I'm enjoying it very much. Um, the, the 15 is one of my favorites, uh, you know, of, of their classic expressions. I, I think the 12 is great, uh, the 14, the 15. And then every year I always get a ball of 21 for my one year anniversary, except for this year. Thanks, coronavirus. Couldn't get to the liquor store in Pennsylvania, but Ooh. it is what it is. But Ooh. no, the 15 is great. In fact, it was Alan that, that really turned me on to this. And uh, in fact, I, I don't know if I've ever told him this. Uh, he is the one that had a story about a certain cocktail that he likes to enjoy with Glenfiddich 15. And that is hands down. Like anytime I go out to like a nice steak restaurant or something like that, that is the cocktail that I get to complete the meal, the experience, uh, which is basically where if you get um, an old fashioned, correct? Old fashioned. Am I, am I right? You get an old fashioned, you ask them to use Glenfiddich 15 yeah. instead of a bourbon. And I'll tell you what, you, you want to talk about something going down like candy. Uh -oh. uh, it, it's just an absolute incredible cocktail. Sounds a bit dangerous, but that's what I like. <laughs> what I know, like. The other thing, though, is that William Grant also has a distillery in New York, Tuttletown Distillery. And they do bourbon. They do a four grain. They do a rye. So uh, though I wasn't drinking a lot of American whiskey when I first started with them, uh, I also didn't want to get left behind, right? And so I had to start to learn more about American whiskey, and uh, that's been terrible. Um, <laughs> it sounds like my worker. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I now buy a, a uh, I buy a bunch of different bourbons, uh, four grains, rye, um, a lot, and I, even to the point now, I'm starting to search them out. And try and get those things that you can't get. And yeah, you were mentioning that before we got on here. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> so I I uh, I started as a as a Scotch drinker. Um, I, every now and then I have a cognac. I like Irish whiskey, but I started really getting into the American whiskey after starting to drink some of the the Hudson Bourbon or their Four Grain, which is my favorite. And then they they have a, something called Manhattan Rye, and then I started really getting back into you know like into this rye kick. And uh, so, yeah, rye is rye. Rye is is surely one of my drinks of choice right now, especially the rye. With, yeah. So I just got a, a bottle for a gift for um, my girlfriend's stepdad. It was his birthday. Actually, it was both his. 
oddly enough, it's it's her, it's her stepdad and mom's birthday. So we we uh, we we kind of broke the uh, stay at home to go over to their house. Everyone took their temperature. Everyone did you know social distancing or anything like that. But we um, I, I picked up a, a Knob Creek uh, Rye Cast Strength, but it was the ten year bottle. So I guess um, batch number two. And uh, I don't know how long it's been out. I hadn't seen the bottle yet. I've I've seen people posting some of the older, like the you know it was, it was bottled in 2010. But uh, if you have you had that one, Alan? I haven't. I have not. Um, I'm I'm I keep going with the story because I do want to hear it. But yeah. uh, there's not much story other than the fact that it's 127 proof, and it uh, it <laughs> does not does not drink like 127 proof, and that's another dangerous one. It had a, a ton of flavor. Uh, if you see it in Ohio, that one's uh, sixty nine dollars, so it's nothing crazy for a ten year old rye, but it it's one. That's why just that you were talking about. That's there's not much of a story because luckily we didn't just pound the bottle because there there would definitely be more stories that I'd be told afterwards. I'm sure. I mean, Especially. there's a there's a lot of American brands that I enjoy. Uh, I'm a fan of the Will, you know, of Willet and what they put out. Um, some of the older Buffalo Trace stuff that I have, and some of their antique collection, which I have, which is great i was just mentioning earlier like i had to through people i had to like make 14 connections i'm not even sure what i owe <laughs> i ended up uh i have a sazerac 18 coming in uh and here's, you know here's the best part too having two boys alec and bradley who are in the cigar business who both enjoy whiskey um they alec will go on a hunt i mean he'll he'll just send me a picture with like one thing on a text like do you want it that's <laughs> Mostly that, local, or are you talk about nationwide? I mean, he's all over the place. So yeah. he just told me potentially there's an Eagle Rare 17 coming in. Uh, he got me the George Dickel, um, the Elijah Craig 18. Yeah. Uh, I actually, strangely enough, was going through some cabinets last night and found a Willet 21 year old family reserve. When you, you start finding your own collection, you know, you start like. <laughs> Like that, I'm not saying there's a problem there, but I mean, I feel like there is. You should go in that room of the house or that cupboard more often, so you know what you actually have. You know what I mean? Which that actually brings me. So before we get into the cigars, I do want to hear this because you were talking about this. I think this is a let's call it a fun uh, stay at home game as well. Is the uh, the 30 days of whiskey you were telling? Me about. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. If, I don't know if you want to share this, but uh, I, I think it's something that people should hear because it's it's very uh, creative, and uh, I think there's a time to not only uh, maybe drink more, but while you're doing it, be a little bit more creative and, and and get the juices flowing. You know, as far as mental capacity, until you have no capacity left that night, possibly. And we're and we're close to that that moment. But <laughs> so every, every night at the end of the night, I go out and I smoke a cigar, and and just try and relax generally it started with relax before i have to get up and go to work the next day and do it all again right of, of which that hasn't happened in a while but um it was about going out and having a little time for myself and i sit down I'd, I'd smoke a cigar or two and and have a whiskey and uh, about a week and a half ago i said okay i'm gonna i'm gonna smoke a cigar i'm gonna smoke you know i've been smoking a lot of of tempest natural tempest nicaragua uh, post embargo, and I actually came back to the office and, and brought some Connecticut's. Something we have our Connecticut is light, but it's got a lot of flavor to it. So, yeah. you know, and, and just and then I would pick the cigar that I want, and then I would go pick a bottle out of you know one of the bottles that I had, and I realized that I did. I think I did eight nights and eight different whiskeys, and then that got me thinking. <laughs> yeah, which, which is bad. To do exactly. There's a lot of thinking that happens after drinking, by the way. Correct. So what I thought was, what happens if I did 30 days in a row drinking different whiskeys, but it would have to have a some kind of numeric connection? Yeah. So if I started with, let's say, Hudson Four Grain, the word four in there would be four, then I'd have to go to a five. And then it could be a something uh, like a whiskey that's aged six years, you know, and just and just keep going. And let's say it was a Glenfiddich 14 and then their age of discovery is 19. Yeah. Their, their grand crew was a 23 year old. I have the Sazerac 18 coming in. I have a Balvini, uh, ton 1509 batch four, which I could use for 15. 
Good. So at, at the George Dickel that I have was bottled in 2005. It was bottled in 2018. That's 13. Yeah. And I just thought. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of aspects to this that you have to, mind you, not only. So you, you said one of the uh, stipulations is that you are not buying any bottles. Like uh, as, uh, you're yeah. trying not to buy any new bottles. Now, if you already have them on their way, that obviously that's uh, according right. to the rules that are completely made up. Um, you can you can do that. So yeah. there are a couple things that people have to think about if you want to play this game. And, and uh, obviously, as we always say, and we don't always say this, but people say this is drink responsibly. But... Um, you have to have at least 30 bottles to start, obviously. So I don't know if you, you, there are duplicates. you put the parameters around this, but not only do you have to have at least 30 bottles to play this game, you more likely have to have a lot more than 30 bottles for the purposes of the number game. Do you have, right. a, you have an idea, ballpark, how many bottles you have in your collection currently? Uh... There's no no wrong or right okay. answer here. Ballpark would be upwards of 300 and probably <laughs> up 400. Yeah, so I mean, you you <laughs> you had the tool belt to play this game. It seems it, it didn't start that way. It just well, it never <laughs> does. It never does. It, it 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 didn't start that way. It it's it. What happened was I ended up going to a a charity event and. Yeah. Uh, they were, you know, they had some stuff up for auction at the charity event, which was for a great cause. It was for prostate cancer research. You know, a lot of guys uh, can can understand that. It, it, it was a it was a great charity, and we ended up bidding on on a whiskey collection that was like a Cragamore thirty seven and a, on a Lafroig forty two. I mean, there was a bunch of crazy stuff in there. For a good and, cause, though. For a good cause. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it had nothing to do with the whiskey, as no. you know. It had Clearly. to all do with the charity. Yeah. But anyway, that got me into like start, you know, some of the collecting, and then it it opened up my palate, and then the next thing you know, every time something came up that I thought was either kind of cool or different, um, I just said, "Let me buy it, and let me just see where it is." And, but the one rule I have, and and both my sons Alec and Bradley will attest to this, pretty much everything is open. I don't buy anything. For what its value is, yeah. where I bought it at a hundred and it's going to be worth five hundred down the road. Yeah, I don't really, I don't really do that. So I just think, I just think that you know, life life is short and you got to figure it out soon. And that's why I smoke cigars not only for work but for pleasure. Right. You know, at the end of the day, and every bottle should be opened and should be shared, uh, just because that's what we do. You know, we provide pleasure and entertainment, all of us, right? Do yeah. that in our, in our business. And so every bottle is, is open and I invite my kids to come over and, and share in all of it. And all age, uh, all age. yeah, so that's matter of fact, one of the reasons I was able to get the Sazerac 18 is because I said to the, to the person, you know, who is kind of like the, this whiskey wizard, I said, this is not for collecting. I said, yeah, it's yeah. going gonna, gonna to be at my place on Friday. And by Monday, it will be open with my kids. And so, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of the rule is open it up. But like, I found this, uh, give an example. You're not going to find, like, if I'm doing my numerical challenge, mm -hmm. um, is that what we're calling it? I think we need to I, I'm not sure. What it okay. I made up the game, but I didn't make up too many of the rules yet. Right, if anyone has a suggestion out there, throw that in the comments of what the name <laughs> of the game should be. Cause we're, we're doing a, a collective effort here. Go ahead. Yeah, so I, I found this like this old White and Mackay 22 year limited edition reserve that I had, that was open, mm -hmm. and I and I you know so I I drank that and I'm like okay I have some, I have something for the 22 number, and that's kind of how it all came about. I've I've heard during the quarantine a really popular uh, thing going on is is these infinity bottles. Have you heard of that? Yes. Yes. Where so Alan's trying to do that in his stomach. <laughs> that, that's what's going on. <laughs> Pretty damn infinity stomach. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Listen, people can do their own challenges. They can go alphabetically as well. <laughs> that's good. I mean, that's good giving people ideas. That's that's, that's nice. That's yeah. a community service. Right we, get, we have to get through the quarantine somehow. 
You really do. And people are definitely hitting hitting the, uh, the the liquor stores. Not in Pennsylvania. You guys still closed down in Pennsylvania? We are closed out. You can use their website, which I think uh, people are getting unemployment faster than they're getting liquor from the from the PLCB website. So yeah, I think in Ohio that would be the opposite. I think people would yeah, get it probably is, yeah. Unfortunately. But uh, all right, let's uh, let's move on to the cigar. And with this part, um, and we can talk about whiskey more. We're not shutting that down by any means. So if anyone has a question for uh, for these two or anyone else that's on there, um, pl- please feel free to, to, to throw it on the comments. We're trying to monitor that. I know I have Dustin Bovey out there trying to uh, to monitor uh, a lot of the uh, questions and everything like that from afar again remotely. Normally he's in the garage and trying to monitor the uh, the Facebook feed. So. I appreciate that, Dustin, being out there. I'm seeing a lot of comments, but please ask questions. So coming up, I have some some previous guests, and these two guys are, are friends of us and, and the, the podcast and myself. I've known these guys for 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 quite some time, one of them, Shannon, but uh, became close from more recently, and Sean uh, definitely more recently. And we're bringing these guys on for, for a couple different reasons. Not only did they have very, very – good episodes they were very uh some of the more powerful episodes with personal stories and and uh it was it was very very nice having them on i recommend i don't know the episodes off the top of my head but if you guys uh, are looking for something to listen to in the in the quarantine obviously this is episode 114 so we have a lot of episodes on itunes spotify iHeartRadio, all the all the stuff also youtube and facebook but uh shannon chapman and also sean wilkinson shared a lot on their podcast episodes but I brought him on tonight because this is an opportunity we have a, a cigar company owner, been in the business for a couple decades, right? Tw- 20 years, 20 plus years? Yeah, almost 25 years. Almost 25 years. So 25 years. And we have two guys that have been smoking cigars for a while that are, are joining us here, but they have not been the enthusiast level until more recently, um, which is good or bad, depending on who you ask. But uh, they're smoking more cigars. They're trying more stuff. They've been on the podcast. They're actually normally they're 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 close enough that they are coming over to be part of the audience in the garage a lot of the weeks. So uh, I've got Shannon Chapman here. I'm going to add to the stream. And then I also have Sean Wilkinson as well. So welcome, gentlemen. Hello. Sean, hello, hello. Shannon, are you there? Hey, what's going on? All right, we can hear you. So, having you guys on, welcome to the uh, the episode here. I know you guys were listening. We uh, we were enjoying the the Glenfiddich 15. What are you guys uh, sipping on this evening? Since you're not sipping on the Glenfiddich 15, because you're not in the garage, unfortunately, for many reasons. So I've got, I am rocking the Angels Envy. It's hard to. I see. I brought that up earlier. Yeah, I've I'm got the Angels uh, Envy right now. Nice. I've got the Jameson Black Barrel. Nice. Both good, you know, bottles. They're good for every day. They're good for, uh, they go with cigars really well. You guys are smoking the uh, the Alec Bradley Tempest Nicaragua as well, correct? Oh, yep. All right. So now we've got everyone on. Let's let's talk uh, cigars a little bit here. So what I know of this, and, and Ryan and Alan, feel free to, to correct me or tell me I'm extremely wrong. But uh, this is a line extension for the, the Tempest brand name for you guys, correct? Uh, yeah, we uh, our original line that came out was Tempest, and then we wanted to do an iteration off Tempest using all Nicaraguan tobacco, right? And uh, which came out as Tempest Nicaragua, which means we have to change the original name of Tempest to the Tempest Original. Yeah, um, and so and yeah, Tempest Nicaragua was basically utilizing trying to understand the the flavor profile of Tempest, and then how do we go about utilizing all Nicaraguan tobacco? And uh, the line has done has done quite well. So now you have Tempest Natural, natural. Tempest right. Natural, yeah. Okay. Tempest Natural, the Tempest uh, Nicaragua, and then you have the Tempest Maduro still available. Uh, we do that. We do still do uh, Tempest Maduro, but it's actually an exclusive now for another okay. company or yeah. a uh, for an online company. Oh, fantastic! So Tempest Nicaragua, we were, we were talking about it last night uh, on the Tinderbox page for the uh, special that's that's going on right now, which we talked about, stay-at-home special. But uh, <clears throat> tell me a little bit about – it's it's 100% Nicaraguan tobacco, correct? Yeah. Okay. Correct. And it, it's made we, – we determined it was it was manufactured. You guys use two factories primarily or two, two companies as far as family co- – like Rice's Cubanos and then also Placencia – Primarily, both the Honduran and the Nicaraguan factory with Placencia, correct? Correct. Okay. And do you work with any other factories currently, or are those? The, I know you work with EPC a bit too. 
Yeah, uh, actually, Alec and Bradley with their line works with uh, mm -hmm. Nesto Perez Carrillo, and then um, we also work with Jesus Fuego. Who, oh, that's right. Yeah, who who is an amazing uh, tobacco man. I mean, he he grew up in fields. He's an agronomist. He's he's phenomenal. So we utilize him as well, and we still do some stuff um, in the Dominican Republic with Davidoff. Okay. Uh, and they've been producing for us since 1999 on one of our lines. Exactly. So, predominantly, predominantly in in Honduras and with uh, Reyes's commands. Yeah, yeah. And with and with, with this, this cigar, cigar, and I've got echo from one of you too. I think that joined us a little bit. Um, but with this cigar, you've got uh, all Nicaraguan tobacco. I, I'm curious when when you guys are talking about Alan primarily when you're talking about pairing the the cigars and and the whiskeys with your different companies that you work with 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 the different lines that they they're part of but with glenfiddich what cigar would you normally pair up with the, the glenfiddich 15 and then on the other side of that what would you normally pair with the the tempest nicaragua 15's prensado is that right alan yeah i can see that yeah, yeah so yeah and and the reason we would pair up the Prensado with Glenfiddich 15. First of all, we go through a process, right? The first thing we look at is the aromatics. So we look at the aromatics both on the, even pre-light on the cigar. We look at the, the aromatics uh, on the tobacco in itself, and we, we nose the whiskey and we look at the aromatics there. And then we start to look at mouthfeel as well, right? And that is, um, if you took some of the whiskey and just put it in your mouth and let it sit for a while, what, what does that leave? You know, what does that do? And then how do we, how do we find a cigar that's going to match up to that? Yeah. And then we start to look at things like viscosities and texture, right? And that is whether it's a little thicker, heavier whiskey and whether the smoke is a little bit lighter or a little bit heavier, a little bit chewier in, in the smoke in itself. Uh, and then we start to go into the flavorings. We start to go to the high tones and the low tones of the whiskey. And then how do we compare that with, the flavor profiles of the cigars, meaning what is the predominant flavor? What are the underlying flavors? Mm -hmm. Right. And then we look at complexities and finish. So those would be the, the parameters that we do when it comes to pairing. So we look at it from the nose, from the texture, from the feel, from the flavor complexity, and then the finish. So that's, that's kind of the style of how we pair. Yeah. And there are two different thoughts on pairing. I think, I think one is, a, con a contrasting uh, con contrasting style of of pairing where you have your whiskey and you have your cigar and you kind of ping pong back and forth and then we look for one that's a little more harmonious in its style where you have a whiskey and it leads you to want more cigar which leads you to want more whiskey and kind of follow that that, that roller coaster yeah, I think that's the more common pairing for people, but I, I agree with you. I mean, it's it's something that, uh, you know, one thing that we, we've talked about this on, on a lot of episodes ever since we started this podcast is that, you know, for me, a pairing, it, it can be either of those things. But the biggest thing that I would say when things don't pair as a contrast to that is when one overpowers the other and you lose one of the two concepts. Same thing with like food and same thing with wine, all that stuff. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a you want it to at least stand up to each other, if not do what you were just talking about and be more harmonious where you're, you're able to get that. Because that is, again, as we all know, being uh, fans of both both whiskeys and, and cigars, that can lead to a good and long night. And you're, you're, you're right. You just kind of keep going back and forth between the two of them. Yeah. And so what happened is, is we have to learn the style. And, and if you ask people, they, they have their, their opinions on how they want to do it. And I don't think there's a wrong opinion. Right? Because really, ultimately, if you ask, you know, there are rules, right? Where if you're drinking a single malt, you don't use scotch. Oh, there's all these rules. You don't use ice, I'm sorry, when you're doing that. But there are the the real rule is, is drink it how you like it and smoke it how you like it. That's the that's the main rule. And cigars, so I was going to say cigars are the same way where it's like even like there's rules about how you cut it, how you light it, how you smoke it and all that stuff. And it's like, get over it. Yeah. However you enjoy it is how you should consume it. And yeah. so... Um, it happens to be though that because we have the whiskey side that we have to be accountable to, right? We have to be accountable to to William Grant and Glenn Fittick. We have to look at what's going to be best for all of the consumers. And so that was the, how we came up with this, um, this, this somewhat complementary style of pairing. 
And that is, is that you have something that maybe is a little more viscous. You need something that's got a little, uh, a little heavier smoke or dewier smoke to it. And then how does it finish? And does one lead you to the other? And yeah. so that's really where a lot of the process is for us. But we take in, it, it, it's a it's a terrible process. No one should have to go through drinking whiskey and, and smoking cigars every night. But we take it pretty seriously because there's a there's a lot riding on it for both companies. Oh, absolutely. So so did you sit individually like with a scotch, with a bourbon, with a whiskey, and kind of go through the whole process? Yeah. What what happens is if you're trying to so Shannon, if you're trying to if you're trying to pinpoint on a certain whiskey that you have, right? That's your goal is to say, okay, let's just say the Hudson Four Grain. Uh, honestly, again, thirty or forty minutes sometimes just nosing what that is. What are the flavor notes that I'm getting, and then that would lead me to what cigar within our portfolio. I mean, we have twenty lines in our portfolio, so there's a lot to pick from, and so it kind of leads me as to where do I think we should go. And sometimes I'm not on it. It doesn't pair and I have to go in another direction. But it's about it's about the consumer, right? Is that if the customer is sitting down and he has an hour or an hour and a half himself or herself, that they have a, a chance to have a you know, have a brown spirit, have a whiskey and have a cigar and kind of just keep that whole mood through the hour and a half. And I don't 100 percent believe in the ping ponging of contrasting style of pairing. Right. I like the complimentary style of pairing. Mm-hmm. Of course, as soon as you throw peated whiskey into that mix, that changes everything. Well, I'm Absolutely. smoking the Tempest here, and I've got Angel's Envy, and it's going together quite well. <laughs> it's going Good quite well. Yeah. I've got like some earthy notes from the cigar, and then some oakiness from the Angel's Envy, and it's it's coming together like great. Perfect. Right. You get some sweetness from that angel's envy. Mm. Yeah, yeah, because that's what I don't like, know if you were if you were listening, Shannon, because the Glenfiddich Fifteen also uses some of the, the sherry cast as well. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's like it complements each other so well that I, I wasn't sure about it at first. As I've got into it, it's just like back and forth, ping pong, smoke, drink. Smoke. It, it's great. It's great. That's good. Sean, how about you with the, the Tempest and the uh, the Black Barrel? Um, I, I love the pairing. Um, I've noticed, too, and this is a good question for you guys. When I usually light up a cigar, and when I first light it up and I retrohale. Can you hear Sean? Gotta... Yeah, I can hear him. If you need to, Shannon, just log off, come back on. Okay. No, not you, Sean. Shannon. Oh, okay. okay. Um, I can't hear you. So it's, when I first light up the cigar, it's pretty sp- peppery, a little spicy through the retrohale. But as I smoke through it, it starts to smooth out. Does that happen? I mean, before I ask that question, when it was kind of, you know, the the, the Jameson is like a nice smooth uh, whiskey, and, and it pairs well when it was spicy. So you got the smooth, you know, the spicy and the smooth. And it's actually pairing well now, but it's actually mellowed out. Is that normal for a cigar when it's got it starts out that it's kind of, got that peppery flavor that spicy flavor at the beginning but now i'm halfway through it and now it's not as um sorry my screen's fading on me. it's not as uh as, as strong now yeah i mean brian could probably answer this but i'm going to anyway um, <laughs> <laughs> so hey, it's the show man the, 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 <laughs> it's the new guys and, and and the source we we got the source here no, that's right so, that's right so, every manufacturer constructs their cigars potentially a little bit differently. And so maybe it's just my mentality, but what we try and do is we try and front load the cigar a little bit because when people light a cigar, they want to know that they have a cigar, that they're getting that flavor. And there are many times that there are cigars that are in the marketplace that someone will say, yeah, it it was good. It took like an inch or an inch and a half to get good. And I don't think, so what happens is I'm concerned always about the cigar catching up to what the expectations are. So what we do is we front load the cigars a little bit. We put a lot of the heavier tobacco in the foot. So when you light it, you're like, okay, I'm in my cigar. I have that flavor and I'm in. And that's why it's a little heavier, maybe through the retro hail up front. Right. Then once you get an inch in, a half inch to an inch in, it starts to mellow into exactly what the flavor is and what we wanted. 
But we just don't want anyone lighting up a cigar and saying, I, I don't even know that I'm really smoking yet. I'm not getting right. enough satisfaction. I'm not getting enough flavor out of it. So it's really just the way we have trained our rollers to construct the cigar. So what okay. you're getting, at, once you're a half inch or an inch in, it should be exactly what that cigar is. And Is that for all or just certain types? Is that for all of them like in general or is that just certain types that you have? No, that's that's pretty much our entire portfolio. That's how we like yeah. to construct the cigar. Yeah, um, I do, and I love that. It it gives you. It's like a it's like a journey. You know, you start out. It's a little bit spicy, but it like wakes you up. Like like you said, you got a cigar. Now it's like now I got it. Now I can enjoy it. And it mellows out, and it, I love it. I absolutely love this. Well, I, Sean, I have to say, I think most cigar smokers, before they light their cigar, there's an anticipation. There's a time of anticipation, of like can't wait to get home and light up or can't wait to get to my tobacconist mm -hmm. and light up a cigar. And so, you know, the, the experience starts way before they actually put fire to the tobacco, right? Because they're anticipating wanting to smoke this cigar. And yet then you find a cigar that maybe doesn't perform mm -hmm. in the first inch and, and it's got to catch up. And so that was never our style. Our style was a, hey, you light up an Alec Bradley, you get cigar, you get that flavor, you get that hit right up front, and it should mellow right into exactly what the flavor profile that we intended. Well, I was going to say, too. I think Sorry, a lot of people Go also ahead. don't want to smoke a cigar and basically get to the part where, quote unquote, gets good just as it's coming to an end. Mm, yeah. No, that's there is a part that is good that it, it might change a bit, and that's <laughs> what I think we're talking about here. But I mean, to go back to that also, Alan, you were talking about nosing. You know, a glass of whiskey, I think that's also you see a lot of people when they they get a cigar. There's some people that do have that little bit of that that tradition where they're they're going to smell the foot of it a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. and so if you have some of that Lajero or whatever, you know, the, the heavier tobaccos or whatever in that foot, you're actually going to get a little bit of that aroma mm -hmm. from that tobacco as well. And then the right. process you're talking about just for, for the, the viewers and the listeners if I'm not mistaken, we talked a little bit about it last week with um, our guests. We had Eric Espinosa and, and Hector Alfonso on. And um, I, I know that that typically that's going to be when you're, you're bunching the tobacco and when you break that off, you, you utilize, there's a technique that it's the consistency. And that's where some of the talent for the, the, the blenders and the rollers there are where to put that, that different tobacco you're breaking off. It's not just because when people hear long filler, they don't, they don't think all the time. It's like, well, why are they putting tobacco back in there? How do you put it at the foot of the cigar? It's the same tobacco typically that's in that, you know, it's just broken off, but then it's strategically placed for efforts like that. But yeah, I will agree with Ryan though, with the, uh, that when you get to the bare end, you guys could get like an Alec Bradley Roche clip or something. I would. <laughs> there you go. It's a nice marketing thing there. In fact, I think mean, mean, you got something you can market. Is you that get the, the name of it, man? That's exactly what we have in the works coming. That, that's the, the, clip by Alec the filthy hooligan Roche clip. I see it already. So, Alan. So, from dream to putting on the shelf, what's the process like? choosing your tobacco, choosing the filler, like what's the process for you? How did that all come about? Yeah. So I think, I think for, for us, um, you know, I was just, it was interesting. I did a, a podcast a couple of nights ago and we were talking about, about how the cigar comes about. Um, with the amount of time I'm already in the industry, we know what tobaccos play well together. And so we, sometimes we try and build off tobaccos that we, that that just play well together and then how do we build upon that to create a new experience there's many times though that we find a tobacco that we like and then it takes time to figure out how do we utilize tobaccos around it mm. to be able to you know to to uh display kind of that specific flavor uh and a, a perfect example is in our in the alec bradley black market is that we had this panamanian tobacco and we had worked for a couple of years on blends trying to figure out how to utilize this tobacco that I just loved. And uh, we went out and created, I think, 18 iterations, you know, one time on a blending trip and we came back 30 days later and just hit on a blend that we loved and it ended up being, you know, ended up being black market. So there are some different ways to go about creating the blends, but a lot of times, most of the time we're very 
focused on something that we'd like to add to our portfolio that we don't have. So we like to, we always try and round out our, our portfolio, something heavier, something lighter, maybe a Venduro, maybe a lighter Connecticut, something that sometimes we purchase a, 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 a huge amount of tobacco that we love <laughs> and we can buy at a good price and we say, hey, how do we come up with something really flavorful that's at, at, a, at a little better price point? Um, especially in today's economy, you know, so we had a question on the feed as well here, um, from Nate, who is, uh, normally, you know, part of the show every week, but, uh, I thought this was a good question here because we're talking about the Tempest and, you know, we talk about, you're talking about tobacco, which is, you know, the, 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 the guts of everything. Clearly. I mean, you can market it a cigar. You can, you can come up with a cute name. You can come up with like pretty packaging and all this stuff, but it comes down to it. Same thing with the bottle. You can make a whiskey look really attractive on the shelf. You can come up with a, a clever name, a beautiful bottle, you know, all this good stuff. But when it comes down to it, it's it's actually lighting the cigar up or, or having a, a sip out of that bottle. You know, Nate asked why a line extension rather than naming it something completely different. And you see that a lot in the cigar industry uh, with, with a successful brand name. Um, so like, you know, Al Bradley Tempest, you're doing well with the Tempest or uh, the black market you just mentioned, you did a line extension on the black market with the Esteli. That's part of that that uh, stay at home set that we have available at the Tinderbox. But why why do you do that? I mean, what what's the strategy behind that? Is it to to cause less confusion as far as just there's? You said you have twenty plus cigar blends in your your portfolio currently, and there's a little bit of uh, of families among those as far as the the line extensions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. I mean, I could give you this really cool marketing answer as to why, but uh, you could. You could. <laughs> but what it what it really comes down to is that is that a lot of the tobacco that we utilize in Tempest was already from Nicaragua, and Tempest was kicking ass. And um, you know, when a, when a line is hot, you want to build upon it. Okay. And so, Tempest has been a. a you know, a, a phenomenal line for us for many, many years. And by changing out some of the Honduran tobaccos and some of the binders and going all Nicaraguan, we thought we could play off the success of Tempest. Right. With, uh, Tempest Nicaragua. So I could, like I said, I could kind of fluff some story, but that's not really my style. So the, uh, the honest, the honest answer is, is that Tempest, you know, is, is kicking at, you know, it's just a great line very well yeah, accepted yeah. and we thought we'd build up you know build upon that that success yeah so there is but there is i mean it is. yeah it's not the the fluffed up story but i mean there is at least with this line there is a a <laughs> lineage there which is another one of your cigars that was not intended but there's a lineage there as far as uh you know that you had that tobacco already in there which is kind of nice as opposed to just coming out with a second blend that's completely different there's no there's no similarities at all in the, the tobacco blends, factories, or anything like that. You just put the name on it because it's hot. So there's there's a little bit of both there. I mean, you you know, you said you didn't put a little fluff story behind it, but I mean, there is a little bit more than like, oh, it's hot, so let's do part two. You know what I mean? Like it's like making a movie sequel because the first one did so well and the, the sequel sucks. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not it's not like that. You're not just going for a money grab there. No, no, no. I mean, we we used a lot. We used all the same base Nicaraguan tobacco that we had in Tempest. Mm -hmm. We just said, okay, let's swap out and see what we come up with. I mean, and then we had to work on the blend to make it work. And then because it was all Nicaraguan tobacco, I mean, we have stuff from Esteli and Condega and Jalapa, all in mean, all the areas of, Nic a lot of the, the growing areas of Nicaragua in, in this line. Um, so it was like, okay, come up with a new name or just build upon the Tempest line. And and that's what we did. So yeah, yeah. I have a question. So. As somebody who's aspiring to be an entrepreneur and like build a business from where I'm starting, how was it for you to break into this business 25 years ago? Like, how was it to break in and build your brand? Like, I know I'm going to pour another great. thing of scotch for yeah, Alan yeah. Answer yeah. The question right now. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good swing there, Shannon. Like I like that. Shannon, Shannon, Shannon. Don't be offended if I no longer go to the glass and I go directly to the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so so it was interesting. When I started uh, in this business in the late 90s, actually the cigar boom was over and there was a glut of material. There were 300 million cigars imported 
and only 200 million cigars consumed. So there was a glut of 100 million cigars in the U.S. market. And it was either it was either some false belief that I could still make it, or a bad business plan, you know, some combination thereof. But I absolutely love the cigar business, and I loved I loved the history behind it. And then I also was able to attend as a guest. I was able to attend one of the trade shows. You know, normally trade shows. People don't talk to each other. They're like, you know, about to rip each other's throats out. But in the cigar business, everyone was talking and laughing and smoking cigars together. Mm. And you fall in love not only with the tobacco and the history, but the community. And so that was the impetus for me to get into the business. And it was tough. You know, in all honesty, it was tough being a gringo in a predominantly Latin business when there were just 500 people that started when I did that were trying to make a quick buck. Mm -hmm. And so there was a, there was a very low trust factor of people going down to Central America and, you know, they, they would literally just bring satchels of cash and say, give me a cigar. And I didn't have the satchels of cash and that wasn't what I was looking for. Right. And I remember going to a tobacco broker many, many years ago. And, uh, and he kind of set me straight and said, look, you got to, you got to continue to pursue what you believe you want to do. You know, if this is for the quick dollar, you're going to be in trouble. And at the end, 98 or 99% of the people that started when I did are gone. And the oh, ones yeah. that are left are people like me, Oliva, mm -hmm. you know, though we all started around the same time and look at that company. I mean, that Oliva is an amazing company and what they've, and what they've accomplished. But we stayed in and eventually what occurred was I would go down and somebody would say, listen, there's this gringo, right? There's this American guy that keeps coming down. He must love it because no one's making any money right now in this business, right? So the boom was over. Like I said, it was kind of went from boom to bust in the late 90s. But I, I loved it so much that I just kept going down and kept pushing and kept trying. And eventually they, they allowed me in. They invited me in. And they're like, we got to meet this crazy guy who keeps coming down here when everyone else is leaving. And I just convinced them that I love it. I'm in it long term. I love the people in this business. I love what it stands for. I love what we do. The, the enjoyment that we provide one cigar at a time. Um, and I'm going to be here whether you invite me in or not. I'm going to keep coming back. And eventually all the people that mm -hmm. didn't allow me in started inviting me in and said, Hey, we can help you. Well, and, you know, and I would ask, I would ask all these crazy questions that like nobody else would ask. So if you think about this, what happens is you'd go in to make a cigar at a factory and they would give you the sheet of paper and they would say, okay, where, you know, on the plant, the, the Lijeros at the top and then the Viso, the Seco, and they would say, okay, what Lijero do you want for your blend? What Viso and what Seco? And I said, well, what happens if I don't want a Seco? And they're like, oh, no, no, no. That's the way the plant grows. <laughs> that's the way the plant grows, and that's how you have to buy it. And I said, yeah, no, yeah. and we're not going to do any business together. I want a cigar that's got a lot of Lijero and a lot of, a lot of Viso so I can create flavor. And sure enough, you know, seven or eight years later, nine years later, they no longer even had that sheet. You know, they, they for you, you know, or for everyone, for everybody, they they kind of abandoned the sheet because they realized that the American market was changing. They wanted more flavor. They didn't want the lighter stuff. I mean, now today, if we use Seco in some products, it's really for the for the for the combustion and the burn, mm -hmm. right? But the flavor comes from the higher parts of the plant. So, I asked a lot of crazy questions. You know, um, I was the outsider looking in and. And eventually people got to see that, that I loved it. I believed it and, and that I wanted to bring more. I didn't want to just do a barter. I didn't want to like, okay, I bring money and, and you bring cigars and let's trade. It was always about how do we, how do we bring something more than that? Um, even, to this, even to this day, you know, with everything going on now with, with this pandemic, um, we, we, we made a decision to, to provide food 
for all 700 people within our factory, our box factory, and the school that we support. But we bought um, we bought supplies, staples for 700 families based on a family of four for 30 days. That's awesome. How, how can I just take from them? How can I just take from this country that's <clears throat> given to me for the last 25 years? You know, I, I just, just posted that story today on BS about how you guys are taking care of your workers. That's incredible. Yeah, it is incredible. Yeah, it is. I, I want to know, Shannon, what, what do you take from that? You asked the question. So after that, what, what what's your takeaway from that for that question about starting up something or, or you know, getting through that entrepreneur? You, like you said, you're starting your own brand, if you will, as a barber, right? So, what's so in, my, in my mind, I, I see a barbershop as a, a place of community, right? And I see cigar smoking as a place of community. And I'm, I'm, in, I'm trying to combine this together <clears throat> where you can get your hair cut, talk all your junk. And if you want to move it over to the cigar spot, hang out, come enjoy a cigar, a drink, a bourbon, a whiskey, a scotch, whatever it is. I feel like there's something missing in our culture right now where people don't talk face to face anymore. <laughs> And I feel like cigars and drink bring that together. And the yeah. barbershop brings that together. If I can combine that in some sort of aspect, it's a beautiful thing. I, I just feel, I feel it in my heart. I feel it in my soul that this is where I need to be right now. And learn from, you know, people that know more, way more than I know about this subject, the cigars and drink. I, I just, I'm just, I was, I'm a sponge right now and I love it. My big takeaway from that with Alan, what you're talking about, and I think that it's, it's very universal is that, you know, in a, in a way you can say like you, you just kind of warm down, <laughs> you know, like yeah. you just, I just kept showing up and eventually they opened the door, you know, I, I'm going to keep coming back and they're going to keep doing it. But I think that's the mentality that, you know, Shannon, for, for your question, what I, you know, what I, what I took away from that is, is that there is, I mean, you, like Shannon, you have this belief, you have this, this hunger right now. And I think that's something that, you know, you can take that story and, and it really is. It's like, you know, Alan, what you saw is something you really wanted to do. You had a passion, you, you had a vision for what you wanted to do. You didn't just do what everyone else did and, you know, said, all right, this is a hot industry. I'm just going to, you know, piggyback on the whole thing. It's like, no, I want to, I want to dive all in. And, you know, even through the, the initial hardships, it's you, you, you keep trying, you keep you keep going, you keep doing it as long as you can without sacrificing, obviously, everything. But I mean, there is a there's always going to be that tipping point. If you have your idea, if you have your morals, if you have all that, you can get to a point where you you break that final little barrier there. And you, now all of a sudden you're in your, your idea is actually coming to fruition and it's something that is tangible almost. And even if it is not tangible, but there's a community, there's a following. I think that's something that, you know, Shannon, that's something that you can take away from that. Hey, Shannon, Shannon, let me say this too, is that the, the, for us, and I think for most, the key to the success of doing what you want to, you know, doing what you want and achieve what you want is relationships, mm. right? So what happened was over the time I had created relationships and that's why they invited me in. I kept coming back asking how they were doing you know, and I and I showed interest in what in what they were doing, and I think I think you're right, right? I think the barber shop that that community and cigars and whiskey all go together, and so it's all about the relationship. You know, the relationships that you, that you have with your customers, you need to have those relationships with the cigar maker who can make you the cigar, with Absolutely. the whiskey that you believe represents you and your heart and your passion and your soul. And then it's not, you're not really selling. You're strangely enough, almost becoming a preacher, right? For like that, for that moment. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the relationships are the key to success. Nice. Uh, that's what I believe. And I believe in relationships. I believe they are the cornerstone of whatever we do. Like for you, you know, like I, I just believe in conversations. I believe in one on, not even one on one, but just pure sit down face to face with its one on one, one on 10 people just relaxing, talking about whatever's on their mind. I believe cigars and whiskey bring that together. They do. Well, I think that's a segue, actually. It's a beautiful Gina. thing. 
Shane, I think that's a good segue. I want to, I want to, before we get further into the, cause that is a, a in my opinion, that's a, a key f- fundamental factor of the, the topic of back to basics. You know, I think that is absolutely something that people take for granted or don't do enough of anymore. Um, and we struggle with that. So I think that's going to be something that'll lead us into that next conversation. But with the, the Tempest, let's talk about the Tempest. Yeah. Um, we didn't, we didn't talk about the blend a whole lot, but I mean, we, we highlighted it, um, talked a bit about it. Um, I did have one question. I think you know who this is before we get off the cigar. I thought this was a good question for Alan because we have him on. Is, uh, Dan asks, Alan, which cigar uh, you're really most proud you made? I know you have a lot of great lines. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny because people normally ask that question followed by, it's like picking which son is is your favorite, right? Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. We actually have a rule here because I have That's two follow up question. By the way, which son is your favorite? That's the next one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we actually have a rule here based on on kind of that question, and that is my favorite son is the one who's within an earshot of me at the moment. <laughs> so, same thing with Alan, the whatever you're Alan smoking. Sitting in front of me at that moment, he's my favorite, and then if Bradley's next to me, he's my favorite. But um it's a good dad right there (laughs) i would i would say the cigar that is probably uh that that brings me the most joy is is our tempest natural yeah is the original Mm -hmm. tempest line one is we've had these interesting successes along the way that have kind of moved our company forward yeah but but our tempest line was what really put us on the map it was our first highly rated cigar uh, it was our first top 25 cigar. And then again, uh, Tempest recently got you know number five cigar of the year. So, but it was, Tempest was the game changer for our company because it brought us a whole new style and a, and a whole new understanding of what we wanted to be as a company. Yeah. So I would say, I would say our Tempest natural, the original, the original Tempest is, uh, probably the closest to my heart and the one I'm the most proud of. That being said, um, (laughs) that being said, I recently just did a fine and rare cigar last year's fine and rare as an homage to my father that worked alongside me for 35 years. Um, And I can just say I have it here. Yeah, we smoked that uh, the last uh, couple months on the podcast, actually. I think that was the one we had Eric on. Yeah, Eric was on that. Yeah, yeah. So, so the new fine and rare. Um, I mean, every time I think about my dad, every day he passed recently, and and uh, I think about him every day. But hard to hear that. Yeah, that's thank you. And that, that cigar probably holds the most emotional. Uh, I have the most emotional connection to. But overall, as a cigar, <laughs> Tempest Tempest Natural is the one that we built our company on. Oh, I think good. that cigar is sort of like so, a, wait, no, go ahead, like a weird cornerstone of the company. And what I mean by that is for, for as long as that cigar has been in existence for the company, um, I think it's one that a, that a lot of the reps and a lot of people down in that office, um, they find themselves smoking that cigar very often. I think people are surprised when you hear, um, Oh yeah, that that's, you know, like Alex smokes that little Corona, that Genesis constantly, you know, and when somebody goes, oh, what do you think Alex's favorite cigar is? And I say, I think it's the, the Tempest Natural and like the little Corona. They'll be like, really? You have all these cigars out there doing really well for you and everything? Like, that's the cigar. And I'm like, there's something about that cigar. And I, I think all of us, you know, whether to me, that that's one of the few cigars where the Vitolas of it, you know, whether it's the Magistry and that Perfecto type, you know, the, the, the old school, you know, 47 diameter Churchill, the little Corona. That's one of those cigars where almost like every every facing of it, I think, is just fantastic. I mean, we do that right as rain all the way through. No, that's awesome. Okay, yeah, a quick question so for you. Did, uh... Wait, hang on, Shannon. Go ahead. Sean. No, Sorry, just, go ahead. Um, just one thing I thought about. Um, you guys sell your cigars through like JR Cigar and like all these magazines you get. You guys sell them through that as well. We do. Okay, so I guess my question is: Are you with every, with the pandemic going on, it's obviously hard to go to a cigar store or impossible to go to a cigar store to buy your products. Is it helping that you have that there, like through those companies that can just have? I know Steve does it; he ships it, but on a, on right. a large scale with some of these other companies that you go through them, you know, 
through the mail and stuff like that to these cigar.com and whoever. Has that helped you in terms of this time of what we're going through? Like, that's yeah. I guess my question. Yeah. So, so uh, the answer is 100% yes. Um, we have a very healthy balance in our company in terms of our internet catalog business and our brick and mortar business. We have a very healthy balance there. We never allow um, internet catalog to be too much of our total revenue, right? We always, because brick and mortars are the key to our success. And so we work very diligently on that. And when brick and when internet catalog wants to do more business with us, we can't, we don't really allow that until we build, continue to build momentum in our brick and mortar business. So people always ask, Hey, if 60% of the cigars, premium cigars sold in the market today come from internet catalog, how come you're not at 60%? Well, that doesn't work for us. What, what works for us is to support our brick and mortar accounts. And then we supplement that with internet catalog. But today with everything going on, the internet catalog companies over the last 30, 45 days are having record numbers. Naturally. So, yeah. You know, of which makes sense, right? But yeah. who can ship, Steve, like you guys, anyone who can ship, I mean, my message today is still, you know, reach out to your brick and mortar, find out where they are in the process, whether they're doing curbside, um, whether they're shipping, whatever that may be, and try and support your local tobacconist. Because those are the guys that are there for you at the end where you need to go, so, you know, you want to go somewhere and have an hour or two for yourself. That's where you're going. So it's important those guys stay in business. It's important to support those. But, I bet you it'll. I bet you it'll grow a little more too when, at least for the northern states, and the weather's finally warm enough where we can do it. That's what I'm hoping too. I mean, maybe by that time, if things will open back up. But it's been like you know, like Steve and Shannon, and myself. We have to sit in our garages. It'll be nice when the weather's nice enough to be able to sit on your back deck or patio and just you know you can get all the ones you want and you get more people smoking. You know, right now it's hard yeah. to do that. That's pretty traditional though, especially in the colder states. You're going to see booms on that. But I, I do like that, you know, as far as, you know, the, the the comparison, I would say, with what you're saying, Alan, about, you know, having a place to smoke um, on the other end of this is same thing with the restaurants that aren't able to have dine in or the bars and everything like that. I mean, that's what we're dealing with. I mean, we're trying to, you know, I know uh, my girlfriend and I, Liz, we're, we're trying to go <clears throat> get carry out. We drive to the place so that we can give them the tip as opposed to and I know that's a newer industry, but like the 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 uh, delivery drivers, obviously, that's a. That's another job that, you know, I'm not ignoring, but they don't have a place to pick food if the restaurants aren't going to be there when we're on the other side of the same thing with the uh, the cigar shops and a lot of other industries is that that is, again, part of the, the conversation with the back to the basics topic. And in, in part two is that this is something that, you know, we have to be ready to get back to that because I would hate to go the route of. On the other side of this is no one wants to be in the same room as anyone else and everyone wants to shop online and stay in their houses from here on out for the next decade or two. I think that's going to be more detrimental than any other you know, thing that we've dealt with at, at any point. So um, I, I agree with that. I, I do want to actually right now, before we end part one, and I, I love doing this, especially with the given company, um, for those that are drinking the Glen Fittick 15, I want to hear what you guys would give it out of 10. So we don't do the 100 point scale. This is a 10. You can go with decimals if you want as far as you want out. But what would you give the Glenfiddich 15 out of 10 as well as present company included the Tempest Nicaragua that everyone is smoking? I have moved on to the lost art at this point. But uh, and Alan, I want to save you for last if that's all right. Sure. On that one because I want to put these guys on the spot with you on this feed here is um, what they think of the uh, Tempest Nicaragua for the guys on the bottom of the screen, Shannon and Sean, and then also Ryan being a uh, rep for the company, also your employee. I'm very interested to hear what he has to say as well. I think that's going to be uh, fun. But uh, so let's start with uh, let's start with Sean down there. Okay. Um, on the Tempest Nicaragua out of ten, what are you what are you giving it? Since you're not I'm drinking, give it, uh, I'm going to give it an eight. I mean, it's, I, I love it. It's the first time I ever had it. Um, I'll definitely smoke it again. Um, like I said earlier, I like the, the spiciness at the beginning and then it mellows out. And, uh, I love the, I love the retro hail on it. Even when it was spicy and it wasn't, I mean, it's just, it's a nice transition. I love that. And, um, 
it pairs well with what I'm drinking, and I will definitely uh, be buying it again. Fantastic. Shannon, how about you? I love the fact that it starts off very earthy. Earthy for me. I love what Sean said. Earthy. I didn't get the spice, but I got the earthiness. But after that first couple puffs, it mellows out into like a uh, just a smooth transition into you can sit on your deck. You can you could be in your car just enjoying the crap out of the cigar and, and <laughs> drinking it with this review right there. Enjoy the crap out of it. I like that. Yeah. Enjoying this angel's envy. Well, it just complements each other and it's just a nice, smooth smooth uh smoke i love it did you did you say crap or craft crap smoke okay. crap shite. smoke the shit out of it there you go. just want to confirm we haven't gone explicit yet so typically part two we get more explicit so <laughs> you didn't give it a, you didn't give it a 10 out of 10 like what, what do you what do you got out of 10 on that i got an eight eight and a half just uh, i love it it's like it's a, it's gonna be a go-to for sure yeah same Fantastic. Ryan, how about yourself? You can rate both the uh, the, the Glenfiddich 15 as well as the uh, Tempest Nicaragua. You're, you're probably for both of these. Uh, the Tempest Nicaragua, I would I would probably go with the eight on that one. You know, it, it, out, out of out of a lot of the cigars, it, it stands up better than most cigars in our portfolio. It, it's not particularly one of the ones that I personally reach for a lot, but. Um, you know, the flavors there, what we were going for, I think everything's very, very well intended. It's, it's not one of my everyday grinds, but definitely one of the ones that is in the rotation. Um, for the, for the Glenfiddich, uh, 15, eight and a half on that one. Again, same thing. It's one of my more favorite ones. I'm not, you know, I always say I'm not a scotch guy. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't had scotches all the way out, so I don't know what's all out there, but um, it's definitely one of my more favorite expressions that we have. Uh, yeah, you can't just give tens out for everything. You know what I'm no, saying? No, it's not a participation right. trophy uh, game here. All right. <laughs> I will it, say it burns, the so therefore it's a ten. The construction has been very good. Like the ashes hold together. It burns very well. It's a, it's a good smoke. It's an absolutely good smoke. I'm getting close to the nub, guys. Can't wait. To get that roach clip. <laughs> I'll grab the roach, the uh, roach clip. Um, so I'll I'll go and then Alan. Um, uh, with the the Glenfiddich 15, I I, I say I mean, it, it's definitely in that that eight range for me as well for the Glenfiddich 15. The thing is with Scotch World, and we talk about we try not to talk about price a whole lot. I mean, by itself, I'd say it's it's eight to nine, probably closer to a nine for me, just because it is. You know, one of my favorites as far as uh, scotches, especially Glenfiddich, what they, they have to offer that I've had. Now, with that being said, it's also in Ohio. It's 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 like 70 bucks, I believe, or 60, 60 to 70 dollars. So it, it's not the cheapest bottle. So it, it's it's got great flavor. It's a good for me, as I described earlier, it's like a kind of an every night sipper. You know, it's a, it's a good, easy going scotch. It's got that sweetness. I like it's got the oakiness. Um, but when you start getting into that, that price range of 60 and up, that's, there's other bottles out there that you could get for a, for a daily sipper if you were to factor that in, which would drop it down to an eight for me. As far as the, the Alec Bradley Tempest Nicaragua, um, I'm in the nine range for that one because, uh, Brian, you brought up a great point. When, when you're doing ratings, I think that it is absolutely doing what it's intended. The blend is, is consistent. The construction fantastic. So the draw is, good, is there. Uh, burns nice and slow. Um, you get a lot of smoke off of it, so that's that's taken care of. And then when it comes down to the flavor, I think there's a lot going on there, but it's medium body, so it's the type of cigar that I can pair with a lot of things. I can I can smoke it on its own. I can smoke it in the morning. I can smoke it in the evening. Um, I can smoke a lot of foods. If I have spicy foods, if I have a a, a whiskey that has a little bit more sweet and spice to it, like a rye. Uh, I'm going to be able to smoke that cigar. It's not going to be necessarily what, Alan, you were talking about as far as being harmonious or the, the, the complimentary pairing all the time, but it definitely doesn't get, get drowned out by anything. And, and it, it's, it holds its own, and the flavor is there every time. So, I mean, that's where I'm closer to a nine based on the price point of that cigar and also of, of what it's intended for. How about you, Alan? So if I start, let's say, uh, talking about the Glenfiddich 15, yeah. um, the, 
I mean, for me, at a, at a 10, I, I think it's a solid nine. Why? Because uh, I think it's a drinker's whiskey, which means it doesn't inundate the palate. It's not like you have one dram or one glass and then you're done. It's like the palate is completely shot. So I, I like the fact that it's a drinker's whiskey and you, know, you, you, you drink one glass and you have a second, maybe you have a third. And it just kind of goes along with your evening. So I kind of like that. I said, I, I was asked one time if I if I had to be on an island with one whiskey for the rest of my life, what would it be? It would be Glenfiddich 15. It's, because wow. it's a drinker's whiskey. Um, when it comes to the Tempest Nicaragua, I would put it right at a nine. And the reason I say that is I don't think there's anything in our portfolio, maybe potentially any other portfolio in, in terms of cigars, that is a 10. Because if you hit a 10, it means this it's the pinnacle of what you've uh, of blending. It means you can never come up with a, a better cigar. And I just can't, uh, that's not how I live. So I think that Tempest is, the Tempest Nicaragua specifically is very much that Nicaraguan earthy flavor it burns well. It's got a lot of great flavor to it. But I do believe that there's always something better that I can try and blend. Our next project that we're coming up with, we always try and get better. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I would think it's a solid nine. It just, it performs well. It pairs well, like you said, after a meal, it's satisfying. But yet, if you had it in the middle of the day, you're going to be happy and it's not going to, it's not going to put you under the table. So. Right. Absolutely, absolutely. And so, with that part, so for those who are listening live on on Facebook or YouTube, uh, we're going to roll into the second part of it. For those on audio, I do want to thank for part one, um, you guys for being here. Obviously, Alan, I know uh, you you said you've been putting in a lot of hours trying to make sure that you guys come come out of this situation um, in the best way you can. Obviously, and you, you, that great effort. And we can talk about a little bit more with uh, how you're taking care of some people down at the factories and people that used to work at the factories for you. Um, so it's it's still nonstop for you, which is which is absolutely fantastic. Ryan, I know you've been trying to be a part of a lot of these things, trying to keep the relationships, the phone going, all that stuff in the industry. I mean, it's it's a tough time for for that as well. Uh, and then Shannon and Sean, I know you guys are grinding the best you guys can right now, given the circumstances. So appreciate you guys taking your night out for this. And then I also want to thank our sponsors for part one. Uh, same as I mentioned before, uh, we do have a Patreon page. So if you guys are interested in, in contributing, making sure that we can keep doing this, stuff like this, this platform we're using, uh, it helps support it. So we appreciate everything that you guys can do is patreon.com slash bourbon and BS podcast. Uh, I know that we have a couple of the, the patrons on the feed and also on the episode tonight. So we appreciate all that support. And then also Tinderbox at Easton. For the uh, weekly featured cigar every week, it's fantastic to do that. Um, they do have, I will throw it up one more time here, 25% off this sampler here, which is fantastic. So you got those six cigars, retail $60 um, at Tinderbox and Easton. You just email them, eastontinderbox at gmail.com, and that will start the process. They'll get back to you within 24 hours and uh, get that out to you. It's going to $45, so it's 25% off. Fantastic deal. And it's actually a good, I think, representation of kind of mild all the way to fuller body from the portfolio that Alan and Ryan were talking about this evening. So what is, uh, that that, that, that's nice right there. What did, what did Ricky Bobby say in Talladega Nights? That's like looking right up a Yasmin bleach skirt right there. That's, that's <laughs> no, that's, I, I didn't put that on the ticker, but I mean, I, maybe you put maybe, that on the ticker. Let's put get that email put it live. Put right. it on the next email. So uh, <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. Uh, also, Altidus USA, who does the continued support, which we appreciate those guys there for putting in the uh, the support for another year. That's fantastic. Normally supplying us our second cigar, but we're going full-blown Alec Bradley tonight, which I have no problem with, and neither do they. And also the BS Cigar Company, which we haven't talked about yet, but the, uh, the revamped BS Gold is actually, uh, by way of these two guys, uh, hard work as far as their connections with the Placencia Nicaraguan factory, so... Um, excited about that. It's been, gone over extremely well, the BS Gold, and also the BS Silver is available from them. So thank you, BS Cigar Company. And guys, thank you very much. Cheers for part one. And for those listening on live or watching the video, we're going to roll right into it here briefly. But uh, guys, happy Whiskey Wednesday, and thank you for being here. Enjoy your week. <clears throat> and freeze. And scene. And still live, guys. So.
Um, everyone listening, guys, thank you uh, on the feed, watching on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, some good questions. Sorry, I was not able to get to all of them. Um, but uh, kind of in between here, let's throw one up here. Let's see what's a good question. I'm going to be right back. I'm going to hit the restroom here real quick. You got yeah. it. Anyone else can take a restroom break. Go ahead. When I keep touching that, it's because my screen starts to fade out. I mean, I don't know why. Uh, you don't have an iPhone. That's probably why. Oh, shit. Sure. <laughs> be right back. All right, Shannon. So, Alan, if you're good, I got a question, especially while Ryan's not here. This is probably mm -hmm. the best time to ask this question. Uh so Jonathan Herring, if you know who Jonathan Herring is in the industry, he uh, is with uh, General Cigars. But he asked a uh, question for Alan. You're known for having great reps. What do you look for in hiring them? And why do you why have you been able to keep them for so long compared to other companies? Yeah. So one of the things that that is important to us is um, people who can connect. I mean, you know, one of the one of the rules that I have on hiring a, a territory manager is that if I couldn't sit down and have drinks with them for two or three hours, I'm not interested in hiring them. Right. So they could be, you know, they could be very diligent and and they could be very organized, which are all important for what they do. But we're in a relationship business, and you have to be able to connect. You have to be able to understand what the tobacconist needs are, and be able to connect on that level with them, and uh, and connect with the with the consumers as well. You know, the consumers in the store. You know, when Ryan walks in, consumers, you know, can't wait to, uh, you, Ryan, you can, we're talking about you, so you could leave. I'll, 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 he's putting his headset back on. I'll, I'll see if I can find that question again. I asked this question, Ryan, uh, in the in the interim here. Uh, you can read that. Now, it's, you might have to listen back to this episode, because while you were gone, there were some things said, and I, I, I'm glad you weren't in the room. <laughs> good, good. I'm glad. <laughs> but, but Steve, yeah, ultimately it comes down to that we want to find people that can then that can connect on on personal levels. Yeah. Um, you know, our job as a company is to find a way to say yes, is to get to yes. And so we want someone who can convey the message of the tobacconist, be the ultimate liaison, uh, understand that you know the company has to succeed as well. And and we look for people who can ultimately create relationships. That's that's our that's our, our our method behind hiring. Yeah, I mean yeah, behind, behind work yeah. ethic, right? I mean that's a big part of it. Is that you know if someone walks into a shop, can they talk to people about what they're not only about what the product is, but just talk to people, like you said, sit down, have some drinks, and just have a conversation. Correct. Which goes back to and Shannon's not not on the the feed right now. He's he's taking the, the break here, but it's kind of what he was saying about what you know the barber shop. Same thing. It's like when you go to a barber, it's not only about obviously the haircut is the end product, but while you're sitting in that chair, you want to have that that level of comfort and familiarity and, and and interest in talking to that person most of the time. At least nowadays, I feel like. Yeah, I mean, look, there's a lot of people like look. There's a lot of cigars in the market. There's a lot of whiskeys in the market, and there's a lot of people who cut hair for a living, right? That's so right. When they go to Shannon, it's because they want to see Shannon. They know they're going to get a good haircut. The product's going to deliver, but they enjoy the time that they're there with them. Yeah. You know, there's conversation. Has your family? What's going on? What do you need? And what are you going through? And there's an ear. So there's there's a relationship based business. And and I mean, it's ultimately uh, even people who used to work with us that no longer work with us are we're still we still communicate. No, that's good. We still speak on a regular basis. I mean, I can tell you, many years ago, um, I had a territory manager I had to get rid of. Uh, just because he moved out of his main territory into some like strange remote area in Virginia that had no cell service. Yeah. And, and I said, I can't keep you. You're out of your main territory. And he goes, okay, I get it. And I'm like, okay, let's go to dinner. <laughs> yeah, That's good. <laughs> you know, and we, we went and had dinner together. I mean, sometimes it doesn't work, but you, you, you want to find people that can represent your brand, uh, represent the integrity of your brand. And, and connect with people. And I think oh, that was, uh, absolutely. That was really That's good. Ryan, you, you passed, so you're good for now. For now. For now. For now. We'll see, though. We'll see. <laughs> now, you can go, going back to some of the stuff we touched on, you know, one, one of the big things was, um, you know, talking about that community aspect and, and, you know, talking like Alan was saying, like the whole idea of going to the barbershop isn't just, 
you know, cutting hair, reflecting off what Shannon said. You know, I'm I'm sitting at my cigar mater right here, Dirty Dog Cigar Shop. That's where I did the podcast from. And, you know, that was one of the things that I, if there was one thing that I drew very early from the owner of this shop, um, as far as our approach to what we were going to do, he said, the big thing we need to understand is the fact that people can go and they can buy these cigars anywhere. There, there's nothing we can't get our hands on. There's nothing that, that that is unattainable to us. They can go to a shop down the road. They can go to another state. They can order online. They can do whatever. We need to understand why we feel that people want to buy cigars here. And that is the most important thing. And, and that was how we framed it going forward was we wanted to establish that community, that hangout, that, that place where people just don't want to miss out. And I, people ask me all the time, we won't get into the, the topic of, you know, cigars and health, but like people will say all the time, like, do you, do you smoke all the time? And I say, well, you know, the, the main time I don't smoke is like when I'm sick. And they say like, oh, do you, do you like feel like the urge to smoke? And I say, honestly, I said, I miss the urge to go to the cigar shop and see what's going on. Yeah. You know, and that that's the big thing for me. There's no like, oh, man, I got to have a cigar today. But the fact that I can't go to that shop and just sit down with the guys and light up a cigar and just see what's going on in their worlds. And that, yeah. that to me is the big thing that I miss. No, I get it completely. All right. You guys ready? Shannon, you ready? Yeah. <clears throat> what are you doing? Oh, fuck. No, like, <laughs> he's, you said you were ready, Shannon. And then you did that. I mean, hey, man, I'm just a guy <laughs> trying to get through life. <laughs> You're doing well so far. All right. Uh, let me just start again as if we're rolling into the audio just for you guys to, to Alan, and you don't always, uh, that's not how it always works for most podcasts, but we break it up in two parts because it goes a little long. Um, all right. So welcome back to the Bourbon and BS podcast. This is episode 114, part two. We are talking with Alan Rubin, owner of Alec Bradley Cigars still. We have Ryan Ponest who is with Alec Bradley Cigars as well. And then we have Shannon Chapman and Sean Wilkinson on the uh, the episode as well. They joined us midway through part one. So if you guys have not checked out part one, make sure you go back and check it out. We were drinking Glenfiddich 15 and also smoking the Alec Bradley Tempest Nicaragua. So um, go back to part one, check that out, hear what we had to say about that, among other things that we chatted about. And then also, if you guys are listening to audio, we had a little bit extra on the video feed. So if you guys want to look at YouTube or also the Facebook Live or the Facebook uh, recorded episode, you can check that out there. I want to thank our sponsors, Patreon.com, which is Patreon.com slash Bourbon and BS Podcast. You guys can actually help support this, help us out with uh, not only some of the supplies, and supplies are sometimes whiskey and cigars. I know it sounds terrible, but it's also to keep this thing going. Uh, as far as you know, getting this uh, this this platform going and, and sponsoring us to uh, you know keep uploading the uh, audio side of it, all that good stuff. So appreciate all the support so far. It's been amazing. Also, the Tinderbox at Easton for the weekly featured cigar, which was the Tempest Nicaragua, and then also the Altidus USA for for bringing us normally our second weekly cigar and the continued support for your sponsor. Thank you guys, Josh Bentley and Paul Waller for all the hard work you guys did for that on us, uh, and then also the BS Cigar Company. We have the gold and silver back in stock, so they are able to ship that to you. If you guys are looking for anything Alec Bradley related, now's the time to act with Tinderbox at Easton. We have a, a, a six pack of a mild to full body sampler that's going to be 25% off. Shannon is pouring a drink in front of the camera. Thank you for sharing. And uh, uh, that's, a great, that's a great way to do it. If you guys are interested, it's Easton Tinderbox at gmail.com. We can get it out to you if you guys email that. Uh, they will respond within 24 hours and get that out to you anywhere within the uh, 48 states here in the United States. And I know there's 50, I'm saying, the 48 that we can ship to. Um, oh, Steve, anyway. let, me, let me just say one thing real quick. That, that sample that you have yeah. really is representative of our company. There's something lighter and mild, something a little bit heavier. Uh, there's stuff there's that, that's a little bit pronounced on Nicaraguan side, Honduran side. Actually, the Dominican side as well. So there's something lighter, something darker. The Maduro, like the uh, the Magic Toast, it's got a high level of sweetness and you know, the metalist in there. So it really is a great representative. And the truth is, anyone who buys that sampler is going to get some really 
cool differences in, in terms of, of style in the portfolio. Absolutely. So it, yeah, I mean, it really is kind of like a like a, a worldwide sampler type feel. Uh, light, heavy, Nicaraguan, Honduran, Dominican. So there's a lot in there. Yeah, we had a question. Yeah, I, what was our second cigar tonight? So I know Shannon and Sean, you guys have the gatekeeper that you're smoking. I had that as well, but with the Glenfiddich 15, I made the the audible call and I went with the Lost Art Prinsado. So, so I, uh, I I made a audible and went with the Magic Toast. Oh wow, you guys are going off script here. That's amazing. I'm sticking with it, man. I'm <laughs> there. You go, Sean. Way to be a trooper. Thank you. <laughs> Take one for the team. <laughs> well, you're not Actually, taking. It. It's not, yeah, it's not a bad thing. Here's a unique segment. Here's where the rep asks Alan a question that he doesn't know about stuff that he should know. I feel like oh, this man. sitting on this all night. Alan, Come I on, actually, man. I actually, yesterday, there, Steve and I, Ryan, did I can't hear you. There's, there's a lot of static <laughs> right now. There, I, I don't believe that. What happened, we did a little 20 minute yesterday talking about what we were going to do tonight and talk about the sampler. And I said, this is, this goes before my years. Um, I had made the comment and I said, I wasn't completely sure, but as far as a premium long fillered cigar, have we ever used Dominican other than the gatekeeper? Yes. Okay. That, it, how long ago and what was the cigar? Well, Occidental Reserve is a, is right. A cigar. Uh, and we've been doing Occidental Reserve since 1999. Which that, one that's the only one that I know of. Is there any other cigars? I mean, there's, there's, I'm sure there's some. I'd have to look through the portfolio to see what we have that we may use some Dominican mm -hmm. tobacco. But uh, in, I mean, Occidental Reserve was our original premium cigar that right. we came to market with. And uh, even though that has some Peruvian tobacco, it's predominantly uh, Dominican. Okay. So, can I hear the story behind this? All right. Before we get into that, all right, I, I want to introduce uh, people that are listening to audio part two. The, the topic tonight is back to the basics, which is what we're doing here a little bit, not only with and, and the conversation has already steered that way a little bit in the end of part one. But um, back to the basics, when it, when we have this set up here, the reason that if you did not listen to part one, Shannon and Sean are, are both now getting to be more experienced cigar smokers. But I would say and I think you guys would agree, Shannon and Sean, that you are newer to being more enthusiasts. And therefore, oh, we're babies. We're you're babies. babies. Older babies, but yes, you're babies. I'm a toddler. You're a baby. Whatever. <laughs> a lot of gray in your beards for being babies. But anyways, um, but yeah, you guys have the opportunity to to ask a uh, you know one of the the cigar owners, the cigar brand owners here, Alan Rubin. You also have a, a cigar rep. Uh, no one really cares what I have to say on this this podcast anymore. It's more with the guests. So it's all about these guys that you have in front of you. So. Feel free to ask away, and and Shannon, you uh, you started with the the filthy hooligan. Is that the shamrock or just the filthy hooligan? shamrock? Shamrock. Yeah, this is a beautiful cigar, and uh, I well, I like to know because I'm an Irish kid, uh, Irish heritage. So how did this come about? So the uh, the original basis behind it is is the hooligan, is the filthy hooligan. Um, and actually, there's, there's a little story back behind that. It was called the Dirty Hooligan when we first launched it. Um, and then I got a I got a text from Jonathan Drew from Drew Estate on a, on a Friday night, uh, and he kind of ranted. And if anyone knows John, you know John can he can go. Um, and he ranted about the word dirty because they have, you know, the dirty rat or whatever. And so not like he owns the trademark on dirty, but we're, you know, we're we've been friends for a very long time. And so I just said, uh, you know what? Uh, there shouldn't be a confusion in the marketplace. And the trademark office gave me the, the trademark. I don't know what you're complaining about. Have a good weekend. And <laughs> that's a good response. That's a good response. And then I got this novel of a text. I mean, it, it was it was like longer than I could read, and uh, and I didn't. And then on Sunday night, before, what you uh, didn't respond to that one? I didn't respond at all. Man, this reminds me of a relationship I had. I tell you what. 
I, I was going out with my wife on a, on a, on a Friday night and you know, whatever my, my, my week was over at that moment. And so I, Sunday night, I came back and said, uh, I'll change it to, to filthy hooligan. And then he, he texted me, he's like, you ruined my entire weekend with Mariellos and I had the worst weekend and I can't believe you did that to me. And I you ghosted I, him? What's that? Because you ghosted him? Yeah, because I wasn't going to give him his way. And, um, and again, know that we're friends. Start, yeah, start yeah. And so, and, uh, you know, you ruined my entire weekend. I couldn't leave the house and this thing was really bothering me. And I said, oh man, my wife and I had a great weekend. Um <laughs> But this, this definitely oh, reminds me of a relationship I had in the past. Jesus. <laughs> was we had already had everything, everything that we had committed to in terms of the amount of candela was already sold. So we changed the name to Filthy, just really out of respect for the relationship. Uh, and we sold that. I think we made a couple of thousand boxes and and Filthy Hooligan sold out. And it was our only, it was our original offering with Candela. Uh, it was it was very well accepted. And then we did that for a couple of years just using Candela. And we said, hey, let's, you know, let's change it up. Let's do something kind of cool. And we ended up changing it to a barber pole and it sold out again. And then what we decided was since we're only launching it, we're only delivering and launching one time a year that we would just take pre-orders. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is you don't want to sit on the candela, that green wrapper for too long because it's also sensitive to light and you don't want it. You don't want to ferment it because that's when you start to lose the flavor of it and the color of it. So we kept doing it as a pre-launch. Uh, we, you know, we make 2000 or 2,500 boxes, whatever it is. Plus we also have worldwide distribution on that. So that included all of our European distribution, our Canadian distribution, all of that stuff. And then, um, and it, it just kept selling out, right? So one year we purchased a little more Candela, not knowing what we were going to do with it exactly. And someone in the office came up and said, why don't we do like a, a tri wrap? We'll do a triple wrap cigar and we'll come up with a name for it. And we ended up utilizing the name Shamrock and uh, mm -hmm. we do boxes of 10, all on pre-order. And uh, they basically get made, get aged, ship in, and within two days they're out the door. So it's all it's all pre-sold stuff. Well, I think speaking for uh, me and Sean as Irish kids, that uh, we appreciate this very much. Oh, I love it! I do. It's so great. Oh, it's so great. It's so great. All right, all right. <laughs> Nate says it's one of his favorite candelas. And I uh, said that one, the current offering is even better than the uh, Just Straight Candela. And I think that's been the consensus from a lot of our retail customers, I feel like. I, it definitely jumps out a lot more, being a barber pole, obviously. But see, what, what happens is the Candela has great natural sweetness to it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is grassy by nature, right? Yeah. Leaving all the chlorophyll in the, in the wrapper. So it, it is a little bit grassy. So what we did by creating the 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 hooligan and the shamrock was to be able to bring those percentages down so you still get the sweetness off the candela but it's a lot more balanced yeah yeah and, and, and ryan donald actually he asks is, is that cigar available at the tinderbox i assume that's what tb means um tinderbox at easton yeah tinderbox at easton has that cigar available it's not part of the six pack but if you wanted to add that on or order it separately we have uh, both the uh the shamrock and the the filthy hooligan as well. So that's that's definitely Thanks, a coronavirus. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> yeah, that got in the way of a lot of things. Um, there's, there's a really nice event around it. Of it but, uh, yeah. <laughs> See, that's a one thing. thing. As a young hooligan, I appreciate it. <laughs> as a young hooligan. So Shan, you the one good thing you could say. They're still available. They are. They are still available. Yeah, absolutely. So with the back to the basics topic, I mean that's something that again part of this is. Is you know anyone out there has questions for these guys on here, including you know Shannon and Sean or myself. But uh, you know, going back to the basics is, is Shannon and Sean. I don't know if you have any questions. And I know Shannon in the first part. For those of you that weren't listening on part one, you had that question, which was you know about starting a company and, and pushing through, and that was a great answer. So listen to part one on that. But I mean, definitely open this up back to the basics. I think this is a time where coming out of this. Uh, 
you know, I was listening to a, another podcast and it was interesting. I was talking to a couple of guys before the, the, the episode, but um, there's a podcast that, that I like to listen to and talking about this time and how there was even an article in, in, in Forbes magazine about how you should, you know, not not really boast about getting better during this time and doing well. It's like you should have some empathy or sympathy for the people that are struggling. And it's I think that that's very valid, but it's about the the time the time that you have now. What are you doing with it? Are you being creative? Are you trying to come out of this on the other side of it? Back to the basics. I think there's a there's a lot of stuff that we've taken for granted uh, over the last several years, decades, everyone's life. You know, going into this part, everything was kind of on cruise control for a lot of people. Um, and there's also some people that are still even before all this stuff. They were grinding. They were pushing forward. I think Alan, you know, your company is it's definitely a prime example of that. You're always, you know taking care of the core, but also moving forward, this puts a halt to it. And you have people, I mean, it's, it's so interesting to see what you're reading are, are the things that are just booming right now. You know, obviously liquor sales, which I can obviously contribute to. And I think some of you guys have as well. I'm not judging anyone here, but, you know, with the liquor sales, with um, like potato chips and junk food and, and, and all this stuff that people are just eating while they're they're, they're on this quarantine or stay at home. It's like you see all these posts on social media. It's like, oh, during the quarantine, I'm going to come out of this like 15 pounds heavier. And it's like, why? Like, you don't have to just sit there and eat. Like, there's things you can do. They're talking about like, um, like this podcast brought up a great example that I'm I, I'm sure is is a fact is that like the, the porn sites are just going through the roof right now. And it's like, you think about that. It's like, so you're telling me that you want me to feel sorry for you because you are, are sitting there at home between video game streaming, eating Doritos and watching porn and then just eating whatever you want and just sitting on the couch because you have nothing better to do. You can't even exercise. You can't stay, read a stay, book. Stay. You can't create yourself. All right. Come I do call water. shops in between all that. OK, I just want to do what? Know. I do call shops in between all of that. I want you to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad that some people can relate to this on both sides of it. Casey and says me, food makes us happy. I agree. But, uh, you know, there's, there's, I think self-discipline can make some people happy as well. Yep. Uh, for me, I, I've really kind of gone introspective, trying to figure out, like, I know who I am, but there's things that in my past that I've struggled with and, like, emotionally things I've dealt with, and I'm working through those crazy things. And I'm a good person, and... I've done some mess up things in my past and just dealing with those and you're able to sit and think about who, who really am, am I as a person? I, I love people. I'm a, uh, I'm a very communicative person. I love community and I'm always the person that steps up. And when I, when I ask you, how are you? That's a real question. It's not a throwaway question. It's, I want to know who you are, what's going on, how, like, really, how are you? And I think we've lost that. And I think this is a time to really dive into when you ask that question, who are you? How are you doing? Yeah, I think self-reflection is a, is a good thing. I don't, I don't say you should, you know, meditate for, you know, 15 hours a day and that's what you're, no, you're doing no. with it. I think the self-reflection is, is big when you go go to that part. I I'm I was about a month and a half ago, I started working out and I was uh, you know, Steve kind of helped me push me in the right direction with um, just getting back on the fitness, you know, in my life. And fortunately I've had I have like a coach that kind of gives me workouts and stuff, and I've been able to stick with those. Um, and it's been I've been on the other side where I eat like crap and I, and I don't do anything. I get sedentary and I just felt miserable and I still struggle with the way things are now because of, you know, I'm like, shit, I'm a very social person. I'm very, uh, I'm an extrovert, but at least I have that to keep my mind sharp, to feel better. Cause when I do me, when I do work out, I feel so much better in those days that I can't or I don't it. And, and when I, and then that falls into depression sometimes, my my go to when I get depressed is eating, and a lot of people. for for some reason now since I've kind of been so far along in this journey and how I've been I've seen different seen changes in how I look and how I feel, 
I don't want to go back to that. I, I force myself to work out every day if I can. And that's the only thing I think is keeping me from turn, taking a 180 and falling into deeper depression and hitting the porn sites and eating like crap. And, you know, it's, and again, any other time of the, my life in the last 20 years, I would be doing what you said at the beginning of like, you know, eating like crap and, and just being sedentary and watching Netflix all day. But man, I can't do it. I mean, I have to, it, I know not everybody does it, but it's, I've gone so far now. I can't even like, if my wife was like, Hey, you want to get some Taco Bell? I'm like, hell no, I don't want that shit. I want, I want something that's going to keep me happy and, 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 and focused and feeling better. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say, I would say for me during this time, you know, I've always been a, what happens is as we've grown as a company, what we what I have found is that there are more people that are dependent upon the decisions that I make, right? Because we have, you know, let's say just under 30 people here in the US. I have a division in Canada um, and we have a lot of people down in Central America. So I, I, where I struggle, like Sean, compared to let's say what you're talking about a little bit is, is I wanna get up and I wanna go work out and I wanna do all of those things but there's times I'm up to four or five o'clock in the morning that I have to think about like, well, man, I, I've got to finally get some sleep. And I think the reason is, is because I'm out of my routine. There are, you know, there are 45 to 50 families, let's say in the box factory that are not producing, right? We have 600 people in the, in the cigar factory, the farmers. And so I always, now I find myself wanting to be, more diligent in my thought process because the most minute detail of how these people live their lives. And so I think I'm feeling a lot, you know, personally feeling a lot of stress yeah. um, to, to make sure that we stay on our plan, that if we're getting some assistance through the payroll protection, that I'm in contact almost every other day with my bank to make sure that, you know, if I need to go into my credit line to make sure that we keep people fed, there's a, I've taken on, I think more pressure than I normally would feel. And so to find that balance, um, I mean, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, to work out or get on the bike or walk for two hours, you know, walk six miles or whatever it is. Uh, Though I, though truly, no matter what I do, I, I do feel out of balance right now. Yeah, I yeah. think that's natural. I mean, obviously, I mean that, but that's the the part of it is that this the, the to to Shannon's point, it's that that self reflection and 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 realizing that you're out of balance. I think that is something that where it would get you kind of in check with not only the stress but try to go back to the basics of what your normal routine is. You know, instead of sleeping in, like obviously, Alan, you're on a different different scope as far as you seem to be getting less sleep. And I think a lot of people out there uh, are getting more sleep. They're sleeping in. They don't have to set their alarm clock right now. And so they, they lose their routine in the hopes that when they get back to it, they're just going to just, you know, that day that everything starts opening back up, they go back to work, they're going to be just fine. And I, I don't think that's the case. I think you, people are doing themselves a disservice by by not staying to their routine the best they can. It's not going to be the same thing. You're not going to work. There is a level of depression. I think everyone's gone through waves. Um, I, I think that this is something that you guys have hit a couple of good points there is that, you know, Alan, you say balance. We talk about that a lot on this podcast is that the, the, the balance there is that you do have employees to think about. You do have family members to think about. You do have, you can't just, there's nothing personal about what's going on right now. And I think that's where, you have to take that, uh, you know, with a grain of salt. I'm not saying we have to go down this, this rabbit hole completely. I mean, we do have, again, some of these basic, like we were talking about the the basics as far as the cigar industry, if you guys want to. But, you know, Ryan, what do you think about all this? You know, it, it, it's been a time where, honestly, I could say for the most part with everything going on, I'm, a, I'm at peace with everything. And, and, you know, for the most part, there are things, you know, sort of like how Shannon said, when, when you think about who you are as a person, you know, I'm, I'm not a person 
two things that I can say about myself, hands down. Number one, I'm always going to find a way to put food on the table, no matter which way I have to. And number two, um, I'm very comfortable in solitary sort of environments. Um, you know, in fact, I, I was joking around with somebody recently where I made the comment, like, you do understand, like, everybody's losing their mind because they're like, oh, man, like, I have, I have no human contact. I'm not seeing anybody, whatever. And I'm like, I spend 100 nights a year in a hotel. Like, you know, like, <laughs> this, this is just like a hotel that has my Xbox in it. You know, like, you know, it, it, it's finding that way to sort of make yourself sort of relevant and, and you know, to, to be transparent with the conversation I had with Alan not too long ago, you know, I, I told him, I said, you know, Alan has made it a point to tell us and, and uh, take uh, a plan sort of with the way the company's going to go where he said, you know, the reps, I, I want to continue to support, you know, I don't want to necessarily see payroll interruptions, you know, we're, we're, we're going to make, whatever adjustments we can to keep everything going. And, you know, one of the conversations I had with Alan was where I said, look, I said, I don't know how this is going to continue to go. You know, that being said, I don't know how useful I'm going to be to you as a salesman in the future. But, you know, I got a digital camera. I like to take photography. W would you mind if I did like product shots or, you know, something like that, something to contribute? And, you know, Alan was pretty happy with that. I, I think from that conversation where he said, you know, as a business owner that, that's looking to provide for people to have those people then say, I'm looking to try to find a way to provide back. Yeah. You know, that, that's a big thing. And I, I think that's, that's sort of my mindset is, you know, looking at things and sort of sitting around plotting and scheming going where, you know, this situation, whether it gets better, it gets worse. We're in it. Nonetheless, you know, you do take a sort of a self inventory and you do have to look and see, where things are going to go for you and, 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 you know, whatever your life is, you know, if you got family, if, if, it, if it's a professional thing, whatever, you know, I, I think there's a lot of self inventory going on with a lot of people. And if there's not, it, you know, I think that's unfortunate, you know, cause I think this is, this is the best time as any to do that. And I think people are going to really learn what they're made out of. I've always had sort of like a, a personal motto. I've sort of always lived by since I was younger um, where I always just used to say adversity builds character where I used to meet people all the time that were just amazing individuals and without them ever saying anything negative whatsoever, where I, I, in the back of my mind, I would be like, this person had something terrible happen to them at some point in their life. Because I think that people need to go through things like that to actually learn who they are and to get more comfortable with themselves and, you know, go forward, you know, and, and just live life. Oh yeah. Like getting fired is a very, very eye opening experience. I can speak from experience there and i feel like that's where a lot of people are going through that right now like everyone just got fired <laughs> yeah yeah i got i got furloughed about three weeks ago i'm in the aviation industry for private jet charters and i mentioned earlier you guys when we were talking before the show started that nobody wants to fly i mean there's nowhere to go to if you fly you want to go to florida or you go somewhere else everything's closed so it's just Planes are parked, and, and and everyone in the entire industry. It's not just one company or another. It's everyone. Yeah, and I, and, I mean, and I don't know that that this statement is going to help, but I think people do need to realize that they're not getting that they weren't furloughed or let go, fired because of anything that they did, yeah, right? Sure, in this sure. situation, yeah, uh, yeah. It, it still yeah. makes them, you know, the 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 greatest person that they were prior to, and and they have to, you know, somehow or another you, during this time, you have to hold on to the fact that you were that same person a month ago or two months ago that you are today. And and as the situation changes, you can't lose hold of who you are. Right. I think it's right. I think that's that's important to remember that this was nothing that you did. Right. This was sure. kind of done. And so you have to hold on to that that person that you know that you are, the integrity that you have, and try and move forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, mental health right now is crazy. For me, yeah. if we're honest, <clears throat> six out of ten days, I'm good. But those other four, I'm thinking, I'm questioning, 
and I'm down in the dumps. And, I, you know, just I think it's human nature just to kind of question what's going on, where we're at, who we are, how can we contribute to life. And it's a struggle sometimes. It, it really is. Well, I think this is where the lessons, are. I mean, like we talked about, I keep going back to the story, you know, with, with you asking Alan about the cigar industry and, and doing this business. These are, these are common, common emotions that people go through, obviously, when they're, they're trying to, to start something like Alan did to your question earlier on part one, Shannon. I mean, again, you, we've got a resource here that feel free to ask questions about cigars or anything else, but it's, it's, these are common things. It's just, these are thrown in your face right now. And it's, it's kind of across the board. Like it's not just one person. It's not, it's not personal. Like you, you're saying it's, you, you have that, but I mean, when you have those four days or whatever it is, it's just like having a struggle as far as going into work that day, or you have a tough meeting or you have a tough client, or you have something like that. I mean, you go through that stress, you go through that. Like, I don't even want to go in there. It, I, it's almost, you have to pick yourself back up when you're doing that. And I'm not going to, give anyone advice on how to handle depression. You know, it's, we always talk about, we're not experts on this show. It's just this is the second part of it, right? This is like sitting around a cigar shop, having a couple drinks. You start talking, Hey, what are you smoking? What are you drinking? What are you smoking? And what do you think of it? All that stuff. And then all of a sudden you start having a conversation with your friends or your new friends or people in the cigar shop. That's exactly what this is. And I think that's where you have to, you have to remind yourself that it's not personal. You have to remind yourself that, you know, you can, you can, Spend that day kind of feeling sorry for yourself, but beyond the clinical level, which I'm not going to get into again because we're not experts, but there is a level where it's like, all right, I got to get up out of bed. I got, I got to get out. I got to let me just go outside and get some fresh air for a second. You can't go very far right now these days, but at least walk out of your house, get some fresh air if you can. Go out to a balcony if you have one, a patio, a front door. I mean, whatever it might be, you just you force yourself to take that first step. Yeah. You continue yeah. with it absolutely like for me so i went through a whole year last year of being in school giving up everything i know money going out hanging with my friends that i love i gave up everything to pursue this passion of barbering right so i get in to my profession and i'm going along all of a sudden boom we're shut down. So it's yeah. like, it's, it's a mind F, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, you I still believe in what I'm doing. I still believe I'm where I'm supposed to be. And I will never give that up. But now I got to figure out how to move forward with it. Yeah. How do you get there? The yeah. one thing that, the one thing that I, that I'd always try to, cause I've fought depression for years and, you know, in a normal day life, it's like the one thing I've learned a lot to do. And I do want to work out is staying in the present and focusing on the now, which is all well and good. But now it's like, when you stay in the present, it's hard to, to even do that because if you stay in the present, you realize you can't do much. And it's like, where you, where you use your go-to to find that, outlet to what you learn from when you when I've been to counseling and then you use that and it's like well shit I go to my present and the present sucks right now so it's like it's like Shannon said I'm the same way with him him and I are really you know, we're really good friends and we hang out a lot and it and we're all kind of along the same lines of wanting to spend time with people and being with our friends and every day is going to be different for I think for him and I, some days you wake up and you can get through it. And other days you're like, damn, what do I do? You know? So. Yeah. I mean, Sh Shannon, if I can just say one thing, um, you got where you are because mm -hmm. of who you are. Yeah. And if you did it once, you can do it again. Absolutely. So and I appreciate that. thank you. You know, and that, I think that, that, that if you have those days, those four out of 10, that you're not feeling where you need to be. Remember where you, where you got. Remember remember how you got there. That's that same person, and you did it once, and you'll do it again. Oh yeah. And I think I touching them. touching on Shannon, that. Alan, Sean, Steve. Um, you know, there there's a shop owner that had a conversation with me recently where 
he's in a position where he owns multiple businesses, you know, very different businesses, both going through a lot of hardship right now. You know, one of them was a cigar shop. You know, he, he was, you know, an account first and he became a friend. And um, one of the things that he talked about was he had did a massive retooling of his cigar shop, you know, eliminated certain streams of revenue because he didn't think in the, in the big picture, that was something that made sense, um, you know, in his cigar shop, you know, he wanted to focus primarily on, on sort of getting back to basics. I, I am a cigar shop, you know, I didn't start out a cigar shop, but at the end of the day, I became a cigar shop and that's what I am. So, you know, he eliminated roll your own things like that. And the one thing that he had said, you know, in the midst of sort of venting and, and griping and all that stuff, as he said, if I can just get past this, you know, if I if I can get through, I, I I did this all right before the worst time of the year seasonally for for a shop in the Northeast. Now we got you know COVID nineteen shutting down all the stores and all that stuff. If I can get through this, no one will ever stop me. Like that that's not that's not going to happen. Great mentality. You know? so, and I think that's the big thing is knowing awesome. that you know. And I, I've said that before about like business plans. People that started businesses, some of them opened up opened their doors up. You know, the day before this stuff happened, you know, and then you go, well, was that in the business plan? Like, what do you do in the event of a global pandemic? Do you have a hundred thousand dollars sitting around that, that, you know, you have planned, you know, to run this business basically not the way it was supposed to be ran. That's never going to be a question when you go to a bank or when you go to anything like that. But you know, that whole mentality of if you could just get through this, if you could just white knuckle it, if you could just hold on, get through it, there's no stopping you. There's nothing that's ever going to be, I think, this difficult as a business owner for a very long time. Or as a person, too. I mean, you can dial that down to just, you know, your individual family life, right? If you don't have that income coming in and you're, you're trying to file for unemployment, you're digging into your savings, you're digging into your credit availability, <laughs> doing all these things just to survive. I think that's something that you can absolutely do, but you obviously have to make sacrifices as soon as you get past that, that it's. Like you're saying, if I can get through this, like I need to get through this, like it's it's going to happen. Uh, Melanie, I assume uh, she knows Ryan based on her last name here, but she has a, a great point where, you know, you have to have she works in mental health. And so you, you have to have a support system. And so that's the other thing is that anytime things are going well or things are going not so well, like right now. I think that's another time where, you know, the topic is very, very pre uh, prevalent there is that you have that support system. We had Josh Bentley on a while back um, and he brought up this concept of having a personal board of directors. And so anytime he's going through this, it was a great, great concept. We said that was a great T-shirt idea. But a board of directors for yourself is is having people that you look at as mentors or at least sounding boards or you value their opinion. And it's not always the same necessary uh um not necessarily the same aspect of life or the same uh venue or or it, sometimes it's you have a different person you call on when you're having a a decision that you're struggling with or you have you want an opinion that you can't ask your boss you can't ask your wife or you can't you need to talk to someone about it of like what am, what am i doing wrong what am i what do i need to do here what am i not thinking of and i think that support system that melanie brings up is a, a great part of that is because when you're, you're doing this and when we take things for granted a lot of times, it's the, that people are going to be there. So you have to find that support system so that when you're you're even say things are going really, really well. That's a great time also that. And Alan, I'm sure you've had that over the years is that when things are really, really going well, that's actually when the, the bigger problems actually really hit you. Um, I mean, you, you, I mean, that's speaking of that is. You know, the, the story that you had a great interview a while back of the, the Prince Sato, you had the cigar of the year and all of a sudden you're like, oh, shit, I have the cigar of the year. Now what do I do? You're like, things are going really well. I should be really happy about that. You're happy about it for like one second. Then you're like, oh shit, now I got to do something about this. I mean, the, the problems can present themselves whether they're going well or bad, but you have to have that support system. Yeah. First thing I want to say is, is that, uh, you know, the name of this show is Bourbon and BS. This is real. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is the BS part. Yeah, no, this is a, this is a real conversation. I mean, I, and I, and I have to tell you how much I appreciate it because I think, you know, I'm very fortunate. Um, I, I have a group. And first of all, my family is a huge support system with me. And with my kids in the business, with Alec and Bradley in the business, they see daily what I go through. Um, and, and they're here for me. And my wife has been a, a tremendous support. But I also have friends from high school and college. I mean, literally my roommates in college that I speak to daily. Really? And, 
when things are good and things are bad, both, we bounce <laughs> off each other. And that is a huge help for me. Sometimes when I'm feeling, when I'm feeling my most stressed, one of my friends will send me some ridiculous meme that just kind of breaks me out of it, you know, and I'm like, okay, let me, let me keep things in perspective, but they're always there to lend a hand or have a conversation. Everyone goes to, you know, through things differently. But the one thing I can tell you is that as a cigar community, um, we're tight. The cigar community, you know, as a whole is really tight. And there are people that are that will be there for you, whether whether I had to be there for a certain tobacconist that were struggling or they they said, hey, I, you know, let me let me support your line or whatever, whatever those things are for one another. But as a group of people, we bond over these these, you know, I call I call them these dead leaves that we roll up that people enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. But we bond over this and we create relationships and friendships that are lifelong. And so as a cigar community, just because we're going through this pandemic doesn't mean that we're not there for one another. And I think that's what people have to realize. Like, Shannon, you told me, you know, you went through a lot to get where you are today. And you believe that. And I, I've always said that the barbershop of the past is the tobacconist, the cigar store today, oh, where people come in and talk local politics and sports and, and have conversations. And at the end, everyone's still smoking a cigar and enjoying each other's company. And you want to replicate that mentality in your business. I mean, that's, that's what we do. That's what we provide. Somebody had asked me one time, what is your elevator pitch? And I said, I'm in the, you know, I'm in the adult entertainment business. <laughs> I had like more floors to that elevator right there because if it's one I'll floor. You, I'll, I'll say this: it does grab people's attention, right? Oh, but, yeah. Said, yeah, we. I. I. I'm a premium cigar manufacturer, and we provide adults a level of entertainment. You know, a uh, uh, kind of that vacation. It's it's kind of that vacation and still being able to stay at home, and yeah, yeah. and and we provide that that chance to get away. And relaxed and i said so we we entertain adults that's what we do and we we are a, we are a community we're a bunch of rebels right because we don't follow society norms and but man we're tight i don't care i don't care if we're all fighting for shelf spaces manufacturers when we're together on a phone call or we're together for dinner uh or drinks you know a, a bunch of manufacturers together we're just friends and we're fighting the same fight. And I think as consumers, the people that you have that you have relationships with, that doesn't change just because you can't see them at your, at your cigar store. Well, I think, I think people have to remember, hey, it's okay to reach out, text your buddies, talk about it, be on these virtual, you know, be on the shows, be on the podcast. Man, connect. Just because we can't connect in person doesn't mean we can't connect. Mm -hmm. And I think that will help get us through this you know, over the next month or so. And, yeah, and I don't, I, I don't I, think people are giving people enough credit themselves credit for doing like, I mean, like Zoom and, and I mean, we're using a platform called StreamYard for doing the podcast, but Zoom, Google, Google Hangouts is still a thing. We've, we've had uh, some Google Hangouts. It wasn't a thing before this. What's you that? Know, like, that's the interesting thing about that is like Google Hangouts was like something that kind of wasn't a thing for a while. Like that was yeah. one of the parts of Google that wasn't being utilized all that much. And then, something like this happens and it just shows that it actually has a place. Yeah. Well, you reach out to people. I mean, that's the other thing is, I mean, that's a definitely one of the basics is, is, is the human interaction just because you're, you're in your house, you can't go to work right now or whatever it is. It's, I mean, you, you have to use the tools that are available so that you can, you can have some sense of normalcy. Um, because I think that's where it is something where you have that human, human interaction and, and Shannon, you brought it up. You're all about, you know, the face to face. I mean, you can't necessarily be in the same room, but I mean, we have the ability nowadays to, to do this is, is to just reach out. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that I remember when like the, and I know it was out there before that. And I was giving Sean some shit about, you know, not having an iPhone, but I remember the, the whole iPhone four like advertising campaign is that you could have FaceTime with someone. You could see it like it's 
you know, we're living in the future right now is that you can see it on your phone. You can have this conversation with someone. And now it's right now we're, we're this is all we have, <laughs> you know, for a lot of people, this is all we have. And there's some people that aren't even reaching out. You know, you talk about the cigar community, something that is your, your support system for a lot of people, like you were talking about, Alan, if you have their phone numbers, send a text, start the dialogue. You know what I mean? Be the, the one that's actually proactive about this and taking that first step because a lot of the times you know, going back to the basics is is taking the first step or that self-realization you're like all right so hang on i'm i'm, I'm over complicating this uh, i'm making this too difficult on myself given the circumstances whether they're negative or positive take a step back i always use the uh the, the example and and the guys know this alan but it's when you're, you're kind of in a situation and you it's like you have a hand in your face and you can't really focus on anything at all because it's just right there in your face. It's all you can think about. It's all you're seeing. That's everything. But you can't focus on the hand. You can't focus on everything else. But as soon as you take a step back and you move that hand away, now you can see everything a lot more clearer, including the situation that you're dealing with. And I think that's something that people can definitely take advantage of at this this moment, this time that we're dealing with. I, I will confess. I mean, there are times just there are times where part of my depression is is I will like just kind of turn inward and not reach out when I probably should. And I know Shannon and I are, we have a long relationship of uh, him doing that. Like he'll call me or text me and there are just times where I'm like, I'm just not feeling it because as good as this is, it's just not the same. And I, and, and I'm just confessing it because I probably should do it more um, where I do struggle with, People reaching out, and I just I don't want to talk to anyone, and I know that's not a good thing. Yeah, but I know there's a lot, and there's a lot of people out there. I'm sure in the same boat that it's just I don't know. It's just sometimes hard to to even muster up that okay, I'll, you know, I'll call, and I know what I know they all mean well, but sometimes when you fall into depression, it's hard to you know to to ex like reach out or if somebody's reaching out, reach you know, respond back to them. Shannon is, is threatening to kick in my door multiple times in, in my house to say, <laughs> right mother effort, you don't answer me soon. I'm going to show up your front door. And I'm like, shit, I better answer him now. But, <laughs> but it, eventually it helps, you know, but it's sometimes it's hard to take that step and reach back out or respond. And, and just since I got you, Shannon, never take it personally. It's just something that I, I've always struggled with. And, and I'm sure other people have too, but, it's it's and again it's a day by day thing. It's just I gotta try to sometimes get out of that funk. And sometimes there are days I can and sometimes I can't, you know. So what is it about cigars for you guys that that brings that that sense of community? Like you Sean, you're talking about you, you know, you miss hanging out with, with people like in the garage here, you know, or or you know, just out and about, you go up to the cigar shop or whatever it is. I mean, have you ever sat and thought about, like, it's a great time to think about that. What What do you actually enjoy about that? And, and what is the difference of where you're at now versus where you were at before all this happened? I think, like, right, like, being in the cigar shop, there's, there's camaraderie that you can build more than obviously doing this. Like, you know, in the past few months, I've, I've been to Tinderbox a lot more, and I've met probably 20 people that I never would have met by doing this, you know, right. so you, you like, I'm, I re reunited with uh, Dave Merrick. Mm -hmm. I've known that guy's playing soccer growing up with him. And I just realized, Oh my God, that's, you know, I know who you are now. And it's like rekindling relationships that I've never known that I've had a long time ago. And then meeting people now that just being present in that cigar and in, in that tinder box, it's just, you walk in and like, now I'm getting that feeling. I feel like Norma cheers and they're like, Hey everybody. And I'm like, Hey, you know, so I love that. Yeah. I love that, you know, and, and to do it virtually on, on, on this, it's, it's a good thing to have, but it's not the same. Yeah. You no, know? I, th I think, I think, right think, on. I think Sean, it, it, there's a couple of things. One is if you got three or four guys that you connected with at the store, yeah, it is a meeting like, Hey, w by the way, with, with no agenda, like, you know, Tuesday at nine, the four of us are going to get on or invite somebody, maybe a fifth or sixth. And you guys just kind of shoot the shit, you know, and it's 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 different, but it's still a connection. And you're still hearing other people's stories and what they're going through. And you're able to communicate. That's one. And I think for me, what I've tried to do is through this whole thing is to make plans. It's good. Yeah. You know it's what? 
when, when this thing is over, four of us or eight, eight of my buddies, we're going to go, we're going to do a little golf trip. You know, you try and you, you try and make the plan like, hey, when this is over, I have some. It gives you something. Oh, like, I'm going to have a fucking party. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's do it. I mean, I'm going to. We're all going to group hug, too. <laughs> but I, I, I do think it's important to have something to look forward to. Because when you talk about going through through the depression, what happens is you start to find that there's maybe nothing to look forward to. Yeah. And, and you know, and I think everyone struggles with that. I know I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the reasons why I don't think I sleep is because the time between the time I lay down and the time I go to sleep, my brain is is moving. Yeah. And I'm like, what am I looking forward to? Am I looking forward to playing golf tomorrow? No. Golf mm-hmm. course closed. Yeah. If I were to seeing everybody in my office, no, that's not happening. Yeah. So I have to, I, I try and make plans. I'm like, you know, say to my wife, Hey, when, when this is over, we're going to get, and we're going to go here. And yeah. I say to my friends, Hey, why don't we get together and we'll drive an hour and a half away and we'll play a golf course we've never played before. And I love that. Try, and, try and make the plan. So I have something to look forward to. Yeah. That's a good idea. I, like I think the sense of camaraderie is something that's interesting, uh, I think, and everyone on here knows each other from a, 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 a hobby or a lifestyle with a cigar industry, right? That's how we're all on this feed, and people that are listening are, are typically either they, they know someone on it or they were referred from it. But it's interesting, as, as people grow up, you know, your friends, and Alan, it's, I, I, I really kind of, I, I, I grabbed on to that point that you're still communicating with friends that you've had for a long time. I think that's that's sadly a, a rarity these days because people kind of drop off. You know what I mean? The the days of Facebook obviously is is it's helped, especially nowadays. But I mean, as you grow up, I mean, you think about who your friends were as you you grew up. It was kids in your neighborhood, right? That that's who you were friends with because of proximity. And then all of a sudden, you had friends in school that had you know, either in the same classes or as you got older, you had you had things that, you know, you had in common. You played the same sports. You had the same hobby. So now all of a sudden those are your friends. But then you, you move away. You graduate high school. You go to college or you go to work. And all of a sudden as you g- grow older, it's like now who's in your neighborhood? Who's in the apartment complex? Because everyone else is starting to move away. So now all of a sudden it's a proximity thing all, all over again. It's all right. So I have work friends or I have my kids, parents they're my friends now because we're, we're going to soccer games together. And now these are my people. And you're just kind of like forced into these, these social interactions because you have something in common. And then you get this cigar world. And this is where, you know, a lot of friends are, are, are really created. And Alan, you said something like we're kind of the rebels or whatever. But when you talk to people about a cigar shop that you go to or someone that you know, and I always go back to it because my, my previous career was in moving and storage. And it's like nowadays, if you think about it, who are you actually calling to help move a sofa? Because I guarantee it's not going to be probably a childhood friend. It's not going to be someone you played football with growing up. It's not going to be, you know, someone that you work with. You go in the office and ask someone like, hey, you know, can you you help me move? Uh, I got plans this week and I'm sorry, I can't help you move that sofa to the third floor or whatever you want to do. But when you get to the cigar shop, there's a different level of community there. And then now you're in kind of the same boat on a, on a, on a day-to-day basis. And I think that's the one silver lining that people can have when you're thinking about that. It's it's all personal right now is that you have a lot, a lot of people you don't know that are in the same boat as you are right now. And so that is a very big common bond that you can actually maybe capitalize on and, and, and reach out to people. You know, obviously not in the grocery store because you look the apart, you know, all that stuff. But you start talking to people and you get on these these mobile herfs that they're called, especially in the cigar industry. Or if you you have family or friends, and you're like, hey, you know. And you almost put it to a challenge like, hey, someone invite someone that the rest of us don't know. And I think that you might spark some new interactions and new thought processes that that might actually spark your your well-being on a day to day basis because you actually have something in common. I mean, I've been trying to do something different and, and doing with the cigar and whiskey podcast. We don't want to talk about covid or what everyone's going through. But right now, that's where the conversation seems to always go. And because it's it's everyone's going through the same thing. So, you know, everyone on here, I feel like has met someone new a little bit further and people listening have that. So I encourage everyone to kind of take that that common bond that we all have right now, as shitty as it is, to take it to a point where you can actually have a new interaction with someone. And then on the other side of this, hopefully have some sort of spark between the two people or multiple people that you continue that that social interaction. Once things get back to, to quote normal, 
don't lose that that sense of well being. Right. I'll, I'll tell you something. I think you you kind of it, it, it peaked some some memories and some stuff in my head um, when in my previous life when I was doing some studying for criminology, justice studies, that stuff. Um, in one of the classes that I had to take, there was a book that we had to read. And this book was called The Emotional Survival of Law Enforcement. And that provoked a very large sense of cheesy hippiness that I just didn't want in my life at that time. But I had to read it to get through the class. And of course, I didn't read it. I, I skimmed it to try to get the answers. And through skimming it, you know, you have to absorb something. And then sooner or later, I, I, I read that book front to back. And one of the big tones that they talk about is sort of like, so you go to school, you're in high school, you got high school friends, then you go to college, you get college friends. You don't talk to your high school friends, now you have college friends. You know, Then you go into the police academy and then you don't talk to your college friends anymore. You talk to the people you went to the police academy with and then you get hired as a police officer. And then you don't talk to your academy friends anymore. You just talk to the people that you went to the police or that you, that you work with on the force. Then you stop talking about your family because you don't really want them to know what's going on at work. You're trying to protect them or whatever. You begin to get this distrust of the general public. You don't watch TV shows anymore. You watch cop shows. You don't watch movies anymore. You watch cop movies, you know. And it was actually kind of that awakening that kind of got me a little dissatisfied with that lifestyle. I, I was going out to the bar every night after my shift. I worked PM. And me and another guy, and we would go and we would hang out at a watering hole at a fire hall, which I don't know if that's a thing in some of the states you're in, but it's basically a fire hall that operates a bar to help sort of pay the bills, whatever. And, you know, typically the people there, they're all EMS and they're, they're, they're firefighters or they're cops. And we would go there and everybody just talked about what fire they saw that day or what, what person that they helped doing this or, you know, they, they got their foot pursuit or, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it was something that I, I, I grew a distaste for it to the point where now I'm in the cigar industry and I'll hang out with other reps. You know, there's a few reps locally that live in Pittsburgh for other companies. We'll sit down and smoke a cigar and they'll start being like, hey, do you see what this company did on, on a half wheel today or whatever? And I'll be like, hey, you want to shut the fuck up. Like, you want to just sit around and smoke a cigar and fucking not talk about any of that shit? Like, can we, you know, and I think. That's something that's kind of unique to cigars. Granted, I'm I'm in a different level of it than than you know most people, but I think that's the thing that people like about cigars because you can just sit there and you can smoke the cigar, and it becomes less about the cigar, it becomes less about what's going on. It just comes to be about the people that are there and the conversation mm -hmm. that happens. Yeah, and I think when we're talking about getting back to basics, you know, and I, I get what Sean's saying. It's not the same, but I think there's still a level of that conversation that, that you should be reaching for it. I think that is healthy where I don't think it necessarily has to be, you know, I, I get, it's not the same, but at the same point, I think that's, that's part of the thing that still keeps us human at this point is that yeah. talking with each other and that camaraderie and that support, that's all still there. That's all still available to you. And it might not yeah. feel the same way, but I think it still has the same level of impact. Um, Be being on this definitely shed some light, and I don't know if you can share or not, but Melanie, I don't know, Ponist or Ponist is, um, she had a really good comment that I wanted to read real quick. It okay, says, right. I, I, I gotta, I, I gotta let the cat out of the bag. That's my mother, by the way. She's never oh, done I any of this tonight. She wanted to see this for the first time, so that well, is, that awesome. is my mother. She's, she's all awesome. over it. I love having her on. She did really good. Um, what she said was, is that, and it kind of kind of hit the nail on the head, I think, for all of us, if I can find it, it's, I guess, okay, she goes, a cigar smoker, a cigar smokers are a different breed, I think you guys made a good point, when you walk into a cigar shop, your friend, <clears throat> your friend, it's a brotherhood, it's a sisterhood, no matter who you are, be it an attorney, a doctor, a mailman, or a cashier at Walmart, once you walk into that sh shop, your family, just like this live uh, podcast, I'm sure it was helping Sean and Shannon more than we know. And it is. I mean, just being on this has really kind of shed some light on good moving forward in a different way. So expect more calls from you, Steve Machina. <laughs> oh, I mean, I, I can tell you when we talk about cigars and what cigars do, there's a, there's a couple of things. One is 
you know, people talk about tobacco. Sometimes when they're outside of the cigar industry, they don't understand that, you know, what we do is different from other tobacco products. And, and I think that what people need to understand is that, uh, you know, the cigar that's addictive, it's the lifestyle that we crave. Right. And it yeah. says what do cigars do, you know, what do we do for a living is, is we break barriers and we build bonds. that's what we do. And that goes, that goes right to your mom's point is that when you walk into a, when you walk into a cigar store, um, all the barriers are broken, right? We all just, we all just enjoy the passion of the cigar itself. I mean, I can tell you many years ago, I remember doing an event in, in, in Dallas, Texas. And uh, at the end of the event, um, the event was over and I was sitting down on the couch. Finally, after like four hours, I sat down on the couch and to my right ended up being a guy who works at the local gas station. And to my left was the guy who was the president of, a, of mm-hmm. an oil company. No, wow. Good, good. I thought, man, where else other than the cigar store could you get three people just talking and talking about life and what we do and what we love? And one guy pumps the gas that the other guy is the president of the company. I mean, right, right. it just doesn't happen. It's what we do. And actually, Shannon, very simple to what you, similar to what you do is being a partner, right? You can have people there of all walks of life. And the, and, and the cigar in itself breaks those barriers and it builds bonds amongst people. And, and that's really what we do. That's what we do for a living. So yeah, man, that's, it's, it's special. What we do and who we are as a group, it's special and you just can't replicate it. It's real it's powerful, powerful. I think. Yeah. Shannon, what questions? You've, you've been quiet down there. You're, you're reflecting down there. I can see it. You're on video, by the way. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah, I know. I, I'm just listening, man. I'm, I'm, I'm taking it in. I love it. It's just like what Alan just said that, you know, I could be cutting somebody's hair and there'll be a college kid trying to figure it out. And the next guy I cut is a CEO of a multi million dollar company, but everybody's on the same level. It's right. just a, there's no, I'm this, I'm that. It's just, it's a, it's an equal playing field. Nobody's coming in touting who they are. They're just there for the experience. Yeah. And I can, and, in knowing Shannon as much as I do, he is born to do this because if you guys haven't already figured it out, he's good with people. He's a great listener. He gives great insight. So I think when people walk away from him, when they're done, you know, getting their haircut is, They'll never forget him. And I think he's already building a clientele so quickly because of who he is. He does a hell of a job cutting hair, but it also, he also contributes to who he is as a person and how he listens and how he gives perspective to people. That's what I was going to say. He would make a great barber. I approach barbering as this cutting is second, the relationship is first. Yeah. I think that's how. We should approach all business that, yeah. yeah, whatever we do, making cigars, selling cigars, cutting hair, whatever it is, that's secondary to that relationship. Yep. Because that relationship is going to dictate how your business moves forward. <clears throat> and I, I, I'll, I'll spend 20, 30, 40 minutes, whatever it takes for that guy in that chair He's the only thing that matters at that moment. You know what I mean? Like, that's the only thing that matters. I don't care how many people are sitting there waiting to get cut. That person in my seat is number one. And I think that's how business should be approached. When you're selling a cigar, whether you're, you're promoting whatever, liquor, whatever it's going to be, that relationship is going to dictate where your business is going to go. Well, I think that's actually relevant to um, kind of Alan's comment about who his favorite son is. Um, it's whichever <laughs> is within earshot, right? So you, you look at that the same way as you look at business, right? So that's that's a, that's a very important takeaway as well is that whatever customer is in front of you, if you're you're talking to a customer and maybe they, they aren't, you know, the, the, the CEO, they're not the most influential person or they're not the biggest account, but you're talking to a, a customer at that moment and you're having that relationship, 
that is a very, very basic um, mentality there, in my opinion, that if you actually say, you look at your phone and it's ringing, you know this is a big sale, you know this is going to be a big tip or whatever whatever the, the scenario is, but you're with that customer that you're talking to right then, you're with that that son right then, well, <laughs> you're going to, you're going to pay, give that person a hundred percent of your attention at that moment, because then you, you develop that relationship even further. And that, that other person can be upset and all that stuff. All you have to say is like, I, I was busy. I was with someone else. You know, I was giving them my undivided attention, just like I'm going to give you right now. So if the phone's yeah. ringing right now and there's someone else that needs to talk to me, I'm going to give you my hundred, my, my 100% attention. And, and, and I'm going to give you all the, the, the things that you need right now, just like I gave them. And if they don't respect that, I think that's a problem. But I think most people will, because that is a very fundamental way of dealing with people, in my opinion. The greatest yeah. advice I got in the barbering business was exactly what I was talking about. There could be 100 people sitting on the bench waiting to get cut. The only person that matters mm -hmm. in that whole barbershop is the person sitting in your chair. You know what I mean? So that that really set the tone for what I'm trying to do. And, you know, I just want to give that person in the chair 100 percent. I'm not giving them 60, 70. I'm giving them 100 percent of my time. And that's it. I, I deal with um, in aviation. I deal with a lot of pilots um, just dealing with day to day operations. And they're a different breed. Um, I like to call them divas sometimes, but, um, but, but I listen to them and I let them vent. And I think that's another thing too, is just letting people talk, let be, be a sounding board for people. And, uh, I think that's gone a long way. I've developed a really good relationship with a lot of pilots because of that. You know, I listen to them. I take into consideration of what they're, what they're dealing with. And then when they go to the islands, I have them get me Cuban cigars and then we're good. There you go. <laughs> So when, when. Uh, Sean, um, one of the things that you had spoke, you know, spoken about was the fact that you miss being able to go into Tinderbox East and right and, and see everybody and be with them. And it's just not the same. So we actually think as a company, Alec Bradley as a company, that on some level, that is so important that all of our territory managers now are asked to be able to set up these Zoom calls mm -hmm. with a tobacconist and their clientele. Oh, that's oh, great. It's a great that, idea. Yeah, so that we can get one of our, you know, our territory manager who handles the account, the tobacconist, the clerks that work there, their customers, and, you know, me or, or Alec or Bradley or Mike Sirota, our vice president, like somebody from the company also on that call. So we can have a cigar conversation and yet everyone can still connect. Yeah. yeah. And so we think what you talked about was really uh, uh, an important part for our company in total during this time. And that is the ability to connect. Though it's not the same, it's better than not having it at all. Right. 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 Absolutely. So if we set up 30, 40, 50, 100, whatever the number is of uh, these these kind of private chat with with consumers and the tobacconist that they deal with and someone from the cigar industry, you know, somebody from a manufacturer all together on a call, it still brings some level of excitement. Yeah. So, yeah. So based on what you said, that's really important to a company like Alec Bradley because yeah. we, be we believe that the connection is, is inherent to what we do for a living. So uh -huh. Ryan, uh, so how do you, in your position, how do you build that, that customer base, what you do. Yeah. So what happens Our, is Ryan, actually, Alan, I am. Oh, okay. You know what I'm say? <laughs> not, not to cut you off. I know it's one person at a time, but yeah, <laughs> no, he, he asked for Ryan. So I want to get his, and then Alan, go ahead, please. <laughs> so I think part of the thing, you know, to, to give you some backstory about my involvement with the company is, you know, I'd come into the company after, the territory that I was representing wasn't getting the best representation. And the way I looked at it was the Alec Bradley train was getting ready to leave. You can either 
get on the train, you can get off of it, or you can get hit by it. <laughs> Any of those three is completely your decision, and I'm just here to facilitate it. So one of the things that I look forward uh, look for in dealing with, with specifically retailers was, you know, their willingness and openness to, to do that. Because, you know, there, there are a lot of people in the industry, just like there are people in life that are p completely content with going forward and doing the things that they've always done. They're not looking for a change of pace. They're not looking for anything to get fixed. They're not looking for anything. They just want to keep doing what they've always been doing. And the big thing with that relationship, I think, was starting with the people that were most open to the idea of forming a new relationship and, and forming a new partnership. And I think one of the things that I've always tried to do, you know, even though it sounds cheesy, is kind of keep it real with everybody. Where I come in and I don't say that section over there is going to be the Alec Bradley section. I thank you for where you put me in your shop because I'm just happy to have a space there. There's plenty of people you could give your business to, but you chose to give your business to me and I'm happy to be a part of your business. Now, if you come to me and you say, why am I not selling more? Or why doesn't this perform? Or why doesn't this do that? Then I say, well, why don't we try something else? And I try to do a give and take with everybody because it, it can't just all be one way and nothing magically is gonna happen. At the end of the day, there's some times where it's just not gonna work out. You know, I actually have, a decent relationship with people that really don't even sell our stuff. You know, they're, they're obviously not, you know, somebody that I'm reaching out to every day, but they're, they're that shop where if I'm in the area, I pop in and I see them, you know, just because I have respect for what they've been doing. Cause they've been there for a year and you never know. Sometimes things come out of that where you have that guy where, you know, I I've been doing this job for five years. I still will have people that will reach out to me. Um, you know, that I've always been like at, ah, it's never going to happen there or whatever, you know, it is what it is. And then someday you just get that call or someday you just happen to walk in or, you know, somebody says, I'm, I'm going to give you that credit. You know, I was on the phone with a retailer earlier today that the first time I went in there, you know, he had a very negative outlook of everything. But when I came in, he happened to mention the first time I ever walked in the shop, his mother was sick and was in the hospital. And I said, man, I said, I'll tell you what, you got better shit to do than sit here and talk to me. Uh, here's my card. I'd love to talk to you in the future. You do whatever. And that guy reached out to me two months later and he said, I appreciate the fact that you never called me. You never emailed me. You, you came in when you heard that I had something that was bigger going on. You didn't feel that it was a place to, to sell me something. You, you said, deal with what you got going on because that's more important. And he said, I'm putting an order in with you today because you you did what I think a lot of people wouldn't do. And to me, it's it, it's important seeing the needs of people and, you know, um, trying to help them out with what you can and knowing your role and everything. I, I don't think going into a shop and having this grandiose mm -hmm. plan of what's going to work um, is always necessary because I do think that this industry is very unique and you know if you have one shop across the street from another one what goes well and one might not work for the other and just even the way they run their businesses could be completely different and as far as the consumers go you know i think one of the big things with them is is just being upfront and being honest with them you know if i do an event and we have cigars and somebody says i like a mild cigar i've had sometimes a retailer will come up to me and they'll make the comment man i really wish you just sold him this cigar when he said he wanted a mild cigar and i'll say it's not a mild cigar. You know, I only got to sell this guy the wrong product once and put my name on it for this guy to never want to buy from me again. Mm -hmm. You know, that might be okay by you, but if you want to have some longevity with me and you want to have some longevity with this brand, these customers have to understand that when I'm trying to help them, I'm legitimately trying to help them. So I, I think that's a, a very big thing. And, you know, with, with the theme of the show being back to basics, one of the things that was cool is I recently, we, we shifted my territory and I took West Virginia and West Virginia had been a place that seems like it hasn't seen a rep in a very long time. And I'll tell you what, I loved going in there and having retailers rip my asshole a new one. It was fucking great. <laughs> I, I enjoyed it. It, it, it really was. It was getting bad. I, I'm sitting there with a Cheshire cat grin while these guys are telling me all these things about what they think of me or my company or the cigars or whatever. And I'm like, this is fucking great. You know, like, like you know, I, I, <laughs> there was something about sharpening those skills again that you hadn't used, you know, in a long time. Because at this point, 
I feel that a lot of my territory is familiar with me or familiar with the brand. And they, I, I feel like they do kind of have a better idea of what, what we're up to these days than they did five years ago. So to go into a place where somebody's completely ignorant to everything and, and them say, you know, these are the problems, whatever, it, it's good to sort of get back in that groove and, and, and sort of get back to the whole idea of, man, I'm selling something now, you know, and I'm going in there and I'm telling this person, this is the way it's going to be. And I told everybody on that trip, I'm not here to take your money. I don't even want you to place an order with me this week. I'm here for one reason. And that's to show you that from this day out, things are going to be very different than you've been used to for a very long time. And to me, that's important. It's reestablishing those relationships there where they know that guy's not just in here looking for the sale. He's actually here to support me and he's here to support my business, whether it's with him or without him. And I think that's very important. <clears throat> Well, so, you're going to be back too. You know what I mean? That goes back to Alan's story with getting into the business, right? It's, it's, you, you keep at it. You know, it's not, yeah. you're not going to make that huge sale the first time you walk in the door, or the first time you have an interaction with someone. You're not going to change their, their opinion of maybe you or anything else, but it's, it's the, the constant consistency of, of that, that, that type of relationship that I think is, is really, that longevity is where the, the impact is made in anything in life, especially with business. Right. Yeah. I, I love that story. You said, Ryan, that you left a salesman at the door and you brought Ryan inside the business. And that's huge. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's huge. For me, that would that would set me at ease because like, you're not trying to pound me with some sales, like buy this, buy that. You're bringing you in. I'm going to relate to you, not the product. You and at the end of the day, in, in a lot of scenarios, at the end of the day, that's what a lot of people are buying. You know, they they are buying, like Alan has, has brought up time and time again, it's very much about the relationships here. It, it has a lot to do with it. We we recently, you know, went around and talked to some, some a handful of shops to get their feedback on stuff. And one of the things that I laughed was one of my accounts when I asked them, how do you set up your humidor? And they said, well, we look at several things. And one of the things on that list was how much we actually like the person selling us that product. That had a lot to do with actually how they put product in their humidor. If they felt that that person actually had their interest, if they felt that that person did their job, if they felt that that person was going to give them an honest take whenever they would make decisions with the product mm -hmm. of that company, that was a very big part of actually how they built their humidor. Well, I think that's, that's a fundamental skill, right? Going back to the basics is people buy from people they like. That has always been one of the number one sales rules that I've I learned years ago. And that's that's absolutely a lot of the times it's now granted, if you're an asshole, sometimes it's not going to work out for you. You know, maybe sales long term is not for you, but some and, people and like assholes. I've dated a lot of girls that way, you know. Well, and, I was gonna say relationships <laughs> don't work out for you well either because people buy from people they like no matter what the arena yeah. is, but yeah, if you're you're like Shannon said, you know, you came in as Ryan. I mean, that's that's a huge, huge takeaway. I think for everyone is that you know people buy from people they like always. That that is how that works. It's not necessarily the product. It's not what's in the bottle. It's not the the tobacco because there's a lot of cigars out there. There's a lot of whiskeys out there. But if if someone that you respect over a relationship will recommend something based on what you like then they're going to come back again and again and ask them for either that same one or they're going to give you, hey, what else do you think I would like? Or what do you like? Because that's that's one of the best questions, I think, is that when they start asking you, what do you like? What do you smoke? What do you drink? What do you think? That's when you know that you've developed a relationship, that they have a respect for what you think. You know, Alan, Alan can actually verify that this did occur because I texted immediately after. I was at another manufacturer's event standing next to their rep and somebody else from the company. And I said, I, I got a chuckle because four customers had walked up from the shop and asked me what cigar from that company that they should try. And I said, that's when, you know, you've done something and right. you should be proud. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. So, right. So Shannon, let me, let me, let me just pipe in. I don't even remember the question, but, um, <laughs> It was something about building a customer base. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not saying that Ryan spoke for. I thought it was like a filibuster, but um, <laughs> but, but if we're going back to basics, here's what it comes down to: nobody wants to be sold; people want to buy. 
That's the basic. You, no one ever walked into a car dealership wanting to be sold a car. They want to buy a car. It's a great way to look at yeah. it. And I think, and I think that's what Ryan, in his story, was able to say was he left the salesperson out, and Ryan walked in. It wasn't about him having to sell something. It was enticing his customer or potential customer to want to buy from us, from him, buy our products. And I think that that's when you go back to basic sector <clears throat> now too. People don't want to be sold, <clears throat> but it's great when you can convince them to want to buy your product, whatever that is, your product, your service, you, whatever it may be. And I think when you go back to basics, that's how we've been able to build our company through relationships by saying, it's not what we want to sell you today is what are your needs today? What can I do for you today? How can I help you, you know, continue your success? How can we be a part of your success? Yeah. In doing that, we've been able to gain great relationships, you know, worldwide. And and I think that's been what's moved us forward as a company. No, it's amazing. I know in my industry of barbering, it's not – you don't have to be the greatest barber. But if you can provide that experience, nine times out of ten, they're going to come back for the experience, not the haircut. The haircut's always going to be good. It might not be the greatest – but they're going to come back for the barber and how they make them feel and the conversation. That's where barbering, you build those relationships. Like you always want to be a good barber. Don't get me wrong, but you can give an okay cut, but they're going to come back because of the experience. So in your line of field, it's the same thing. You build a good cigar, you build a good place to come to, tinderbox, Ryan, the whole nine. They're coming back probably 90% for the experience of just being, feel like they're, uh, they want to be there. Like you want them to be there. You're really invested in them. I think that's in the same thing with the cigar world. There's a million cigars out there to smoke, but what are you doing to make them want to come back? Absolutely. And this is a time where, I mean, we've, we've gone, we've gone a while now. So, um, let's hear some closing remarks on this one. So anyone, uh, Sean, why don't you start us off with closing remarks here on back to the basics? Um, it's good to be back on the show. Number one, number two is I really, I got a lot out of this more than I thought I would. Um, just hearing everyone's perspective on what we're all dealing with. I'm definitely going to take something from this. Um, I'm a lot more apt to reach out to people and, and talk to them and, and be there for others. And I think that's the one thing for me is in a way I look at it, just look talking about it now is that me being sticking my head in the sand and not talking to anyone it, in a way is, is, is a detriment to others because other people may need to talk. And I usually am the first person I can, I want to be there for someone and I haven't. And I want to change that and, and, and be back to who I used to be in that sense is to be there for others. Um, and I think I got, I learned a lot just from approaching life in general, but approaching with what we're dealing with now. So nice. That's good. Shannon. Hmm. <clears throat> for me, just getting back to the basic for me is, uh, the love for your fellow man. And just, just being real with each other and not being afraid to be who you are. And I, I love, I love the community and I feel that this is bringing us closer. And if I, if we can just get back to community, one-on-one -on -one, groups, whatever it is, just actually talking to each other. The basics of talking to each other is huge. Humanity is huge. And I love talking to people. I love hearing your story, Alan's story, Ryan's story. That to me is like, I think the basics of everything that we do. It's the building blocks of what we're going to do and move forward to really building something. Nice. I, I love that part of it. No, it's amazing. Yeah. Ryan. 
what can I say that I didn't say in my hour long filibuster just now? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. What I, you know, can you say? I, I think, you know, some of the biggest things are the, the, the points we talked about regarding self inventory, um, being real with yourself, being real with each other. You know, I, I think the big thing is, uh, we'd probably all be better off in a, in a better place when everybody realizes we're e even though we all have different dreams and ambitions and, mm -hmm. and we all have different skill sets and, and different prof uh, professions. And I think I said that already, but regardless, we're, we're kind of all going to the same place. And I think it's not necessarily about pushing the person's head down below the water that's next to you, but trying to pull them up as well. And I think, I like that. Getting back to the basics, I, like I said, I, I think it has a lot to do, and I think that's what we drew from this tonight. It has a lot to do with not necessarily how you were doing things, you know, with, with the situation we're in, how you were doing things before, but what it was that you were doing. You know, and like I said, it's it's not about the necessarily sitting down in, in some chairs and smoking a cigar next to each other. Um, you know, it's taking from that the, the conversation and, and the camaraderie that, that, you know, was really the heart of that whole situation to begin with. Nice. How about you, Alan? Um, you know, we all come from different walks of life. One thing we all have in common is 24 hours in a day. And uh, it's what you do at that time is what makes the difference. That's great. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I look at this as, uh, you know, with, you talk about back to basics. I, I think this is something that we, we should do on a, on a regular basis, um, you know, is, is trying to, if need be, again, whether times are good or bad in your life, uh, someone else that you, you hold dear, you know, or you're, you're listening to someone is, is the reset button sometimes really is, is something that is imperative for long term success because, you know, that that's one of those things that. You know, when anything's going wrong with technology, what is the first thing that you do to, to get it back is you do a power cycle. You turn it off and turn it back on again, and hopefully everything just sinks again. Sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes you do, Alan, need a good night's sleep if you can ever find that coming up here uh, in your future, hopefully. Melatonin. <laughs> Melatonin. There you go. Yeah. Whiskey also works, but sometimes yeah. not as well as melatonin. But, you know, whatever. 28 and 29 Alan will find peace <laughs> yes, exactly. but I think that this is something that we're you know a lot of people right now are kind of in a reset mode and um, we didn't even dive into the fact that you know with the the adapted personality when you're out at work you're outside of the house and when you're in your natural state back of the house well now all of a sudden when your your house is normally the place where you kind of re relax and and, uh, you know, kind of re revamp your, yourself. It's now you're there a lot for a lot of people. And I, now your, your, your worlds are colliding. So this mm -hmm. is an opportunity. I think that you, you take that opportunity to, to, to reset, to, to, to come out of this and, and, and start it now is, is to, to go back to your normal behavior, wake up at a, a normal time. This is something when you find yourself out of sync, when you find yourself out of balance, kind of reflect like Shannon was talking about earlier tonight is you reflect back on yourself is like, what am I doing differently that when I was my best self and when I was really, really just firing all pistons, what was I doing then that I wasn't doing now? Because a lot of times it's not other people that, yes, you need your support system, but most people I feel like your best example of what you can do has already happened in your past that you were just firing. Everything was going right. And that's something that sometimes you are your best example for what you can do to correct what's going on now. And this situation has been forced upon a lot of us, most of us, if not everyone. And this is an opportunity to hit the reset button and really start honing your skills like Ryan was talking about with, you know, going into a sales uh, situation with a, a shop that that didn't have much going on. So you walk, you're ready to take your, your licks, you're ready to take the blows. And then all of a sudden it's like, now I really have to, to do what I know I can do and what I've done before. And this is what I think most people hopefully coming out of this is go back to the basics, go back to your own basics of what you know that you can do. And Alan hit that a lot tonight as well with Shannon and Sean and like, you know, you've gotten there already. So don't take it personally. This is not what is, is something that is necessarily a reflection of your performance of who you are. It's you've gotten there before. Now you're going to get there again and hopefully come back 110% a 
120%. You're going to get to this <clears throat> new level if you address the situation at hand in a, a as positive as a mindset as you can. So if you guys don't have anything further, I want to thank you guys for being a part of uh, episode 114. Uh, Alan, yeah, sorry. I, th I thought we warned you. This is the BS portion of it. It's a little bit different than uh, your typical cigar bourbon podcast. For sure. As the night goes on, much like a night at the, the cigar shop or uh, drinking with some friends. So, guys, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to our sponsors, Tinderbox at Easton, uh, Altidus USA, as well as BS Cigar Company. If you guys want to contribute, patreon.com slash bourbon and BS podcast. Guys, I want to raise a glass. Happy Whiskey Wednesday. Guys, stay happy, healthy, and safe. Thank Here you. Guys. You guys. A great pleasure. Thanks, thanks for having thank me you. on tonight. Thank Phenomenal. you.